Hello everyone, it's me Joe, and I'm back with another reaction. Tribal, I hate you. So, hi everybody, how's it going? Yeah, I'm back, and now I'm back with a video that I definitely put my foot into. So, as, as everyone knows, I started doing Anamarki's his, history vids because they were recommended to me through my through my reactions to LaserPig, and recently I did his first part in his Enterprise history series. So far, so good. Then, a person asked me in the comment section if Enterprise was my ship waifu. I corrected him in saying that Enterprise is not my ship waifu when it comes to Azure Lane. That honor res Yes, don't worry, random. Part 2 will come. I am doing the whole series. Relax. But I'm not going to do it all in one go. We got to break this stuff up. We got to break We got to chop it up and do, and do different videos in the time. So part 2 will come and so will the rest of the parts after that. Do not worry. But I had to do this because like I said, someone asked me in the comments if Enterprise was my ship waifu. I corrected him, mistakenly, in saying that that honor belongs to the Queen of the North Sea, the mightiest ship to ever sail, Bismarck's sister, Turpitz. And then my admin tribal decided to recommend me this video and call me out entirely, the fucking traitor. So I figured I'd do this video in order to basically, you know, take get this out of the way before people start bombing me with it. No pun intended. But before we watch this video, make sure you like and subscribe, turn on notifications, follow me on all my social media down below in the description, follow me on my Discord, and if you want to keep supporting this channel and keep giving that adorable puppy dog right there cookies... There's a little link down down there. There's a little join button for my YouTube membership. You get cool little perks like get your name at the end of this video. Though we definitely need to update that because, well, we'll update that after after my ad, head of Megan's gets back from Babs. Anyway, shut up, random. Anyway, here we go. Let's talk about the history of Turpits. Okay, let's get this video started. Three. Two, one, and play. All right, let me have it. Ah, there she is. In her beautiful fjords. Yeah, I have to admit, she is probably one of the most beautifully photographed. The Royal Air Force, I'm assuming? Yep! You know what, since we're going to be dealing with a lot of aircraft... Hi, Nate, it's going good. Since we're going to be dealing with a lot of high-altitude bombers, one moment, I shall return with an old friend. Time for an old friend to make a comeback. Helmets on, everybody! This'll work. Ah, shice! Not again. I don't care what the frickin' other crowds call Bismarck calling them. Oh, it's a he. Tradition. They will always be she. T Turpitz is a she. I don't care what 
all the fuck. I don't care what Wikipedia says. I do not care what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia, in my mind, will always be written. Is that that is the home of the Sigma male lazy historian? No, Turpitz is a she. So shy. So silence. Okay, I had to do that fake out joke at least once because every YouTuber has done it, and I guess you can call me a real YouTuber now. Mm. It's kind of a rite of passage I had to do. Thing is, though, if I actually made this as a meme video for April Fool's Day or something, it wouldn't actually be that far from the truth. Turpitz never really fired her main guns for anything other than training or air defense except for once. That's true. She never faced another surface vessel in combat, and most of the time, she was so short of fuel she couldn't even deploy. But like her big sister, she has a reputation as one of the most famous Nazi wonder weapons. A beast true. so powerful that should she put to sea, she would vanquish the Allies in one fell swoop. I can even now... Hear the Hearts of Iron keyboard warriors telling us to annex Romania for oil in order to sweep the Royal Navy from the sea. Mm. And true, she was the heaviest battleship ever put to sea. I know, I know. Yeah, but yeah, I know, Miki. But like I said, I don't give a shit what the fuck they say. I don't give a shit what the fucking Germans say. That is a lo- She is a powerful, lovely lady. So yeah, I don't know. By a European Navy. Really, the only thing that bested her was, of course, Iowa and Yamato. But of course, once again, we have to reckon with the same old propaganda. I highly recommend for a deep dive on this to go watch my Bismarck video. Although most of you should have watched it already, but go watch it. I'll get to that eventually. It's my most popular video, so it's I'll not be with you in a minute. Find. I just need to get the Suffice to say, off the... her reputation and bark. Okay, I am coming. Oh, Jesus, I let you out before this video even started. I guess it's this I guess it's social hour outside for Koa. <laughs> anyway. You can hear him outside through the mic. That is my dog, ladies and gentlemen. Ugh. Anyway. Does not correlate to her bite. That's and right. so I came to ask myself. How do I even tell this story? Because if I do Turpitz, it will literally be, and I'm paraphrasing here, complete sea trials, get bombed over and over again, blow up an island, run out of gas, the dam busters initiate Operation Chastise 2 Lancaster Boogaloo <laughs> with some vertically gifted lads doing a grand slam dunk and game over. Yeah, all in not all, wrong. a lot of uh, sitting in fields, mm -hmm. which incidentally is how she got her nickname. So I'm going to tell this story a little differently. I will tell not of her deeds per se, but the deeds of others. I will, of course, talk about Turpitz's service history and what she actually did, but I will be mainly focusing on the triumphs she made possible for her comrades and the efforts of her enemies to finally vanquish the lonely Queen of the North. Oh, there she is! Oh! I love the artwork for Turpins. I mean, look at this! Oh! She is the true queen of the north, baby! Queen of the north! The queen of the north! The queen of the north! <laughs> Silence! Because I don't care! You're goddamn right! <laughs> During World War I, the Admiral of the German High Seas Fleet, one Alfred von Tirpitz, had been forced to grapple with an unfortunate reality. That unfortunate reality being the Royal Navy, which is a common problem for pretty much everybody for yeah. the past 300 years until the advent of you know, the end of World and War II. And there's Koa. God damn it, what the hell? Why did I sneeze in Did you have your discussions? Did you did you take up the fan? 
and so much. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad my fans are so understanding when it comes to my ownership of you. The waters surrounding Europe essentially belonged to Britain at this point, and even at its peak, dwarfing uh, yes. the Russian and French fleets, the Germans only ever had a force that was 40% the size of the Royal Navy. Yeah. And that Royal Navy wasn't a paper tiger either. Ships like Queen Elizabeth and Warspite were making their debut, along with the hordes of dread- Ah uh, yes, the Royal Navy. The, the only navy on this planet powered solely by tea. Of course they had the big they had to have the biggest navy because at the time they had the biggest empire. My how the mighty lion has turned into a pussycat. Fight me, tea drinkers! Or should I say fish food? <laughs> America, baby, fuck yeah. Rednoughts that have been rolling out of Britain shipyards for much of the first decade of the 20th century. Faced with the fact that his enemy had not only a huge head start, but the production capacity to double their lead, yeah. backed up by aforementioned 300 years of experience as the world's premier sea power, Admiral Tirpitz knew that a direct confrontation was likely not going to end well. Mm. And though they would end up winning a tactical victory at Jutland, World War One's only real full-scale fleet action, yeah. in keeping with Germany's running theme, Replacing losses while maintaining production wasn't really possible, and while they technically it's did a, win, a it ended Nathan, up hurting them in the it. long run. Thus, Tirpitz decided on a different strategy. By keeping his entire fleet together as a potential threat, i.e. a fleet in being, he could keep the bulk of the Royal Navy focused on containing his forces in the North Sea. This meant they could only bring so many ships to counter the Ottomans and the Austro-Hungarians in the Mediterranean. Well, what was left of the Ottomans. Not to mention they could maneuver around and open gaps for blockade runners, able to sneak through while the Royal Navy was forced to check any of their advances. It was also the British focus on checking the German high seas fleet and blockading the North Sea that forced the Germans into pursuing U-boat warfare, leading to devastating losses in Allied merchant shipping, and of course, the sinking of the Lusitania. Yep, yep. and then we showed up. The fuck around and found out Germany! DON'T TOUCH OUR BOATS! TRICK JUNGLES! FLAM FIRE THAT bitch. Yeah, on second thoughts, maybe not the best idea. Yeah. But the reason I went on this little tangent is because of all the names for this particular battleship to be chosen. In fact, when it comes down to all the famous battleships in the history of naval warfare, the fact that they picked this name, the name Tirpitz, there is no more perfect a name for this ship, because she alone achieved what her namesake had needed an entire fleet to accomplish. Hmm. Even if I had hours and hours for this video, I don't think I can get across just how much effort the British put into killing her. Hmm. The combined naval and air forces of the Empire were dedicated to her destruction to the extent that even her infamous older sister didn't receive this level of attention, hmm. and given that Bismarck had been subjected to the entire Royal Navy in the Atlantic, that gives you some perspective on how badly the British wanted to kill Tirpitz. So, without further ado, let's talk about her. Now, I've already covered the design of the Bismarck class Believe in detail, me, funnel enough, on my video about Bismarck. We'll get to Bismarck but Tirpitz did have date. a refit, seeing as it became evident she needed improving waifu. due to, well, yeah. yeah. So, let's go over some big, juicy numbers. But... Again, I have to stress this. For more precise detail, go watch Bismarck. We will. That's At it. her inception, she was identical to Bismarck's configuration, being her sister ship, and the core features remained the same. Her main armor belt and citadel extended along 70% of the ship's hull in a traditional battleship turtle back configuration. All the same. All of her core components and machinery spaces, with the exception of the sensors and steering, were housed deep in the bowels of the ship. Mm -hmm. The belt armor itself ranged from 8.7 to 12.6 inches thick, Check. with her forward conning tower going all the way up to 13.8 inches thick. Yep. Her deck came in two layers, with a 2-inch layer of upper deck armor, mm -hmm. and a 4.7-inch lower layer of deck armor, right. which, in keeping with the primary belt armor, tapered off at the bow and the stern. Mm -hmm. Her underwater torpedo protection, meanwhile, was fearsome, capable of shrugging off 250 kilos of TNT, and like her belt armor, the depth of the protection was flat out ridiculous. It went all the way along. What 
a little also note on that torpedo protection. Like, believe it or not, on a expedition to Bismarck a while ago, a few years ago, I believe it was actually the James Cameron expedition. They actually wanted to... So basically, a uh, quick little fact on the Bismarck thing. Um, so... After the Bismarck sank, there were a lot of rumors going around. A lot of the Royal Navy claimed they sank the Bismarck, but then the survivors from Bismarck claimed that it was not the Royal Navy that had sunk the Bismarck, but it was in fact themselves. They claimed, the Germans claimed that they scuttled their own ship. And that argument went back and forth for years. Almost to the point where it literally, like, it was... It was almost came down to fistfights. Like the Royal Navy swore that they were the ones that beat that sunk the Bismarck with torpedoes from I believe it was Dorsetshire, the cruiser Dorsetshire, and by some extent I believe the Rodney, which which believe it or not actually was armed with torpedo tubes. Surprisingly, I found that out later, which was kind of cool. But they were not, there was no there was no really assurance. So James Cameron, I believe it was his expedition went down and actually inspected the the torpedo protection armor where torpedoes had hit there there were no there was no like argument that torpedoes did didn't hit Bismarck there were plenty from the cruisers that did so when James Cameron went down there he found the hit mar the hits he found the torpedo hits on her on Bismarck's hull and what they discovered was what James Cameron discovered was that there was damage to the torpedo protection but not the inner hull which leads quite a lot of evidence to believe that Bismarck was in fact sunk by her own crew now here's the crazy thing about Bismarck and the Bismarck class entirely they could take a pummeling their armor was so powerful that the pummeling they received that Bismarck received from the Royal Navy completely decimated completely leveled her superstructure her entire upper decks were 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 a wasteland however the hull itself remained structurally sound and watertight so in all honesty i i have to side with the bismarck class the bismarck class was probably the best built battleships of the german of the germ of the german navy i'll talk i know everyone's talking about the iowas I'm thinking iowas right now so yeah so so but so yeah i will say this the iowas are definitely far more powerful but that's because we learned the iowas are built very similar in ways to bismarck so mm, bismarck started the process so yeah, in my personal opinion, the Bismarck was definitely done for. She when she, they probably sank her because they want because they're like we can't fight anymore. Our guns are gone. Our command crew, the commanding the command structure is shot to hell. Our guns are out of action. Our rate, our everything's gone. We're basically a, flo a we're basically just a floating wreck at this point. The Brit and Ten Buck says what they were mainly worried about war was the British coming over, strapping ropes to her, and towing her back to England as a trophy. So they scuttled her right there. So yeah, I mean to give me the point. I mean, and and we're definitely going to talk about this with this video. When it came to turpits, they had to build and design a bomb bigger than any ever built before just to sink this ship. Which I think he said he were going to get to. So enough of me yak and let's get back to it. While in true German fashion, the weapon systems were practically... I, I actually have to say this random real quick about Yamato. Yamato was not a modern battleship. She was a dreadnought. And dreadnoughts... Here's... He, here's what I have to say about the Yamato class. They are not modern battleships like Bismarck was. They were dreadnoughts. They were built... The idea of the Yamato class was the idea of ship versus ship. They were designed to take on the American dreadnought fleet. They were not designed to take on aircraft. If you look at Yamato and Musashi in their first configuration, which everyone has seen, they were 
not designed to take on aircraft. Bismarck also had an had a dedicated anti-aircraft battery, and so did Tirpitz. But the main reason that it failed was because it was designed that was um, in terms of the Bismarck class, their anti-aircraft guns were designed to take to shoot at tar at planes that were much faster than um, the Fairly Swordfish. Uh, no, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning, Marcus. It was actually after Bismarck went down that he put more effort into the U-boat fleets. Ba before that, he wanted big battleships that, um, to quote, to, po to quote a great big uh, onion, I think he was compensated for something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, in terms of the Yamato, the reason I the Yamato was sunk in my personal opinion, was because it was designed to take on battleships of an old era and was not designed to handle aircraft. So, honestly, Yamato and Bismarck are two different camps. The Bismarck class is a more modern battleship built for a modern war, and the, and the Japanese were building the Yamato to take on other dreadnoughts, believing that, at the time, American admirals would only invest in dreadnoughts, which at the time they did. But then came good old Nimitz and Halsey, baby! But again, that is, a, that is a story for the next Enterprise video, which will come out soon, I promise. Bunkers sent out to sea. Mm -hmm. With 14-inch thick frontal armor and 8 inches of both roof and side protection for the primary turrets. Shit, even the secondary batteries were given the same treatment to their scale. Yep. Essentially, as her sister demonstrated in her final stand, the pummeling this ship could take was beyond other fast battleships of her type. He's got me and it would be basically the standard to beat going forward. Mm. While the other battleships at the time may have been better protected in some areas and the armor configuration being a bit dated, overall, the protection and durability of the... I respect Britain, but I'm an American, Nathan. It's a rivalry. German ships was exceeded only by Yamato and Musashi with the German vessels having more tonnage of their displacement assigned to armor than any other battleship ever built. Hmm. But of course, as with almost all German things, the true strength of Tirpitz lies in her firepower. That's true. The German 15-inch SK-34 was, at least from the technical data available, the best overall naval gun of her era until the advent of the Iowa class and her 16-inch Mark 7s. Correct. While HMS Hood, <coughs> best girl, <coughs> Excuse me. Fight me! And HMS Rodney hit harder in terms of steel on target, mm -hmm. their muzzle velocity was on the lower side. They the same older. reason why Yamato's guns had a lot to be desired, despite their raw power. Yes. On the flip side of that, Prince of Wales and KG-5 had lighter and more accurate ammunition, not to mention more guns to deliver them with. Mm -hmm. But being only 14-inch, they didn't have the same mass or damage. Tirpitz and Bismarck's 15-inch guns were the perfect median, with high velocity oh, yeah. and good amounts of mass in the warhead. Combine this with the legendary Zeiss made rangefinders, of which she had a crap load, which had accuracy and precision better than most fire control radars and to incredible ranges, and you have a magnificent gun platform, oh, which yeah. is aided by the overall design of the ship, as she has a really wide beam that allows for incredible sea keeping and stability, even in the roughest of seas. Like the Japanese, not being restricted in size due to international shipping lanes going through the Panama and oh, yeah. Suez Canals and so well, forth. Well, the Panama Canal is not... Not is having not those constraints you. is a real boost when you want to make really big boats. Uh -huh. In fact, lots of people don't realize just how thick Bismarck and Tirpitz were. Like, look at them. 118 feet wide, or 36 meters to those of us in the civilized world. Fuck like, you. they're massive. <laughs> this did cause issues in the Kiel Canal, but hey... Who's counting when you can stay steady as a rock going 30 knots through an Atlantic mm. storm? Speaking of, this is one of the differences between Tirpitz and Bismarck. Tirpitz, despite being heavier due to the changes made later in the war, was actually slightly faster than Bismarck. While Bismarck was powered by Blomenvoss turbines, Tirpitz used three Swiss-built turbines powered by 12 huge oil-fired boilers, <gasps> generating 119,000 903 kilowatts of power, oh. which, on a good day, allowed her to get all the way up to 31 knots. Mm. 31 knots. This is, once again, just for context, the heaviest battleship ever built in Europe. <laughs> at 31 knots. 
Only the Richelieu class was faster. And Mm -hmm. thanks to the French being the French. French, The ship was neutralized by being stuck in Africa under Vichy (laughs) control for most of the year anyway. So aside from a few small variations, Bismarck and Tirpitz up to this point were pretty much identical. Mm -hmm. A product of her times. A ship to embody all the pompous and arrogant bombast of a fascist nation wanting to project its superiority. It was big, armoured and scary, and Goebbels' cameraman had a field day. And as intended earlier, she had all the good features of her big sister. She got all the same issues, though, which we'll talk about. Her extremities were vulnerable. Her inshore manoeuvring was terrible. Her armor, while strong, was weaker to plunging fire than other armor types. True. Her Fumo-23 radar sucked and could be knocked out by firing the main battery. Yep. The four turret layout of her guns, while making them more accurate, also ran the risk of increasing dispersion and Mm -hmm. limiting the amount of firepower available, as other ships of similar classes had more guns they could bring to the fight. And given that being a Kriegsmarine ship meant that you were always outnumbered, this was highly problematic. Her rudder authority, while incredible for a ship her size, was a double-edged sword due to the wide beam, which caused insane levels of hydrodynamic drag when manoeuvring. Mm -hmm. And likewise, this caused issues in using alternate power steering, as with only three screws spaced inquidescently, so three screws all equally spaced, she couldn't use alternating power to turn properly. Mm -hmm. Especially if you were to say, oh, I don't know, have rudder damage. Yeah. Let's just say the World of Warships community call it getting Bismarck. For a reason. Yep. Torpedo bin, save you now! Come on! <laughs> so yes, Tirpitz and Bismarck. Until later on when she was retrofitted and upgraded. All of these issues plagued her as well. Yeah. But what set Tirpitz apart from her famous sibling? While there were modifications and improvements done all the way along to mitigate a repeat performance of that better damage control procedures general improvements in protection where possible especially around the steering compartment Mm -hmm. there were only two really big improvements sensors and anti-aircraft defense oh yeah the substandard fumo 23 was replaced with not one but several different radars over her service life Mm -hmm. replaced with radar model 26 which was more durable and had a much larger array while a Radio Model 30 and a Würzburg set were added to drastically improve flat gun performance. And speaking of those, much like USS Enterprise did during her refit, watch my Enterprise series, it's really good. We'll get to that When Turbots went into refit, they asked, Excuse me, mein Herr, how many 20mm can we fit on this thing? The answer to that question was, ja. Ja. Yes, all of them. Put them all By 1944, on. she had no less than 58 20mm AA guns aboard the ship. This was in conjunction with 12 6-inch secondary guns, 16 105mm AA guns, 16 37mm AA guns, and if it wasn't enough, they also retrofitted the 15-inch main guns with anti-aircraft rounds. Yep. I'd hazard a guess that given their previous experience with uh, sword fishing... They weren't fucking around anymore. Nope. And just in case another suicidal Polish destroyer showed up, (laughs) Turbots was- I am a Pole! (laughs) Also fitted with torpedoes. Yep! You know, because you are definitely going to get into torpedo range against Turbots. You know, this reminds me of the Chieftain in his deployment story about standard issue weapons aboard the Abrams. But uh, as we're drawing out the weapons, uh, okay, sign for your 9 mils, okay, sign, 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 sign for your rifle. Oh, we all get one? Okay, because usually it was just, uh, I think the driver and loader got rifles, loader had a two or three. Uh, so we all got rifles, um, two M4s and two M16s, one had an, an M203. Fantastic, are we ready to go? Oh, no, no, sign for this M249. Yep. This what? So we ended up, I mean, what do you put an M249? We ended up bungeeing it, kind of in between the TC and the loader, just in case we needed it. Sign for your 240s, okay, 240 there, 240 there. Sign for your shotgun. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shotgun, baby. Shotgun. What do I want with a shotgun? You never know. I like to keep this for close encounters. uh, The loader took, uh, correction, the gunner took custody of that and he unbolted the stock and he turned it into a a kind of a two handled short thing in order to fit inside the tank with him. All right, now we don't know. Sign for your bayonets. Really? I mean, look, I've got a tank. I've got a 120. 
Caliber 50, 2762. You always bring the bayonet, baby. We've got a 40 we got a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. We have a you shotgun. You always carry a knife with you. We have a In case you need to stab someone or there's a cheesecake nearby you need to cut. And if it comes down to the point that this is not working and I can't even run over them, and we're down to bayonets, I'm giving up and going home. It, it is not our day. We are not destined to survive. So we went to war without our bayonets. I did once consider taping a saber to the end of the gun tube, uh, but I realized that my saber costs like $400, and the first round that went down range will be the end of it, so I decided that it's probably not the best move. Look, all I'm saying is if someone got into torpedo range with this thing, they deserve to take the W. You know what I mean? They deserve. They deserve the win. There, <laughs> there is no way. There is... I mean, that takes a set of balls no human being should possess. Although, as we shall see, some people actually do. Yeah. In any case, right ever. that's enough technical talk. As right. I keep saying, for the third or fourth time now... For more detail, check my Bismarck video. We'll get to that eventually. For now, it's time to tell Tepes' story. Mm -hmm. On April 1st, 1939, with the testicularly challenged Chancellor in attendance... <laughs> see, I'm Present still finding new swords! names, guys. Tepes was launched from the Wilhelmshaven Naval Yard to much pomp and fanfare. Screw the Nazis! Fuck you guys! Okay, this is epic. She was christened by the daughter of her namesake, and like Bismarck, she was considered the pride of German sea power. Admiral Dernitz was on unalive watch given the amount of U-boats you could build with this much steel, but egos are important in international politics, mm. and so fitting out began with it being scheduled to be completed in February 1941. And with the invasion of Poland in 1939, the impetus to achieve this work was stepped up. Wilhelmshaven dry dock um, worked around the clock and began to achieve actual miracle. Shit! The yep. libies are here! Right on fucking... So, we good? while all other major Kriegsmarine ships were subject to air attacks, Prince Eugen being one of particular suffering, though she's probably into that given her design, <laughs> Tirpitz had the honour of being bombed while being built. Like, not even under workups or awaiting final outfitting like all the other ships. She was literally bombed in the naval yards in the preliminary stages. Mm -hmm. Only her hull was done at the time. Pretty much everything else had yet to be completed, and the RAF showed up to pay her a visit. From October 1940 to February 1941, Tirpitz was targeted directly four times by RAF Bomber Command, not including standard raids on Wilhelmshaven and its facilities, which was a common target. Hmm. This is even more impressive when you consider that this was a time when Bomber Command was lucky to mount 200 aircraft for operations on any given day across all targets. But by some miracle, Tirpitz survived unscathed to be commissioned on time. On February 25th, 1941, 
Tirpitz joined the Kriegsmarine and began her sea trials in the Baltic Sea, mm-hmm. which she passed with flying colours. Her crew were some of the best Germany had, but she was not combat ready yet. She needed to do workups and get all the kinks out of the system. While this was going on, two things happened to throw a wrench in the works. First, big sister Bismarck met her end gallantly in the Atlantic, going down fighting against a very perturbed Royal Navy. Oh yeah! Sinking their honorary flagship kind of does that. The other was the thing that almost always screws over anyone in the historiography of Nazi Germany, which is, of course, Hitler and Halder's most excellent Eastern adventure. (laughs) Since the Soviets had a substantial Baltic fleet based in Leningrad, there was a serious risk that they could break out and cause havoc before they could coordinate the defensive screen with the Finnish Navy, and so... Oh, look, everybody, it's the Soviet Navy, a.k.a. the tugboat fleet, the the bathtub tugboat fleet of Stalin. (laughs) And now Putin. Oh, yeah, you think I'm ever going to give Putin a rest? Not even, not on your life. Flagship of a Baltic squadron to check any potential Soviet offensive moves. Following behind her in this effort was Köln, Nuremberg, Leipzig, Admiral Scheer, and Emden with a team of destroyers, mostly from the Z series of 1936 destroyers. This turned out, of course... Are you, kid- are you kidding me, Panzer? The, enti- the entire Russian fleet in general's a piece of shit. Honestly, all Germany needed to do was naval invade from the north of Murmansk. They would have been in Moscow in a few months. <laughs> to be unnecessary, as Operation Barbarossa swept the Red Army aside, reaching Leningrad by September, and thus the taking of airbases in the Baltic states meant the Luftwaffe achieved air supremacy, making any Soviet naval operations practically impossible, save for submarine warfare. And one day on this channel, I'm going to need to do a video on Soviet submarines in World War II, because everyone forgets about them, and they were totally badass. In fact, one of them even attacks our main girl of this video, but that's a story for later. With the Soviet, weren't they also trying to tie the Canadians in, in amounts of war crimes? That's what I think the Soviet subfleet was doing during World War Two. <laughs> it's contained. Tirpitz and her charges now had more pressing jobs to do, which for her meant resuming training, which she did on September twenty sixth, nineteen forty one. These workups actually involved the only time Tirpitz would ever destroy another surface vessel in any capacity. She blasted the pre-dreadnought battleship Hessen in a combat trial, as well as plenty of other combat drills. By the end of this period, Tirpitz's crew was in prime condition to carry out the task for which their ship was built. Despite the best efforts of the RAF, who since February had launched yet three more raids, two of which numbering over 100 aircraft, which as I keep saying, it's 1941. Bomber Command doesn't have that much to go around at this stage. They really want to kill this ship. But these air attacks, along with the loss of Bismarck, (laughs) were the impetus to improve her AA defences. The first of her refits. So basically, they finished her workups, they got back to port, and then the continuous RAF raids and the loss of Bismarck meant, okay, we're going to bolt some more anti-aircraft guns on this thing. Oh yeah. And so it wasn't until January of 1942 that Captain Karl Topp informed Fleet Admiral Raider that they were ready for deployment. But where were they going to send her? The propaganda beating the Kriegsmarine had taken after the loss of their flagship Mm. drove the art school dropout to order that no further Atlantic expeditions be taken, lest they lose their new flagship as well. Furthermore, he assessed, quite rightly in fact, for once, shocker, that the war would be decided on the Eastern Front, and so the primary interdiction of merchant shipping should be directed not to the Atlantic, but to stopping the Arctic convoys heading to Archangel and Murmansk. Mm-hmm. providing thousands of tons of lend supplies every week to the Russians. Which Russia conveniently forgets to me- mention in life. Yeah. We were giving them lend and without our lend I think I remember watching an article way back when where a Russian soldier said that if it wasn't for the American trucks... Basically, they, they said that the, that the thing that won the war for the Russians was not the T-34, nor the PPSH, nor any of the Russian Air Force. But it was the American fucking two-ton truck that that we sh- shipped over in literal shiploads that helped them win the war. 
as well as all the fucking Shermans, the P-63 King Cobras, and all the other shit we sent the Russians, because their own shit was either blown to hell or was utterly fucking crappy. Go watch my video that I did for this guy on the Russian Air Force. I went, both he went into extreme detail about how crappy it was, and I lost my mind about it. So, yeah, Russia, remember lend -Lease? We sure do. <laughs> Raider therefore proposed that Tirpitz and the other surface units be redeployed to Norway. It offered the benefit of having plenty of anchorages safe from air or submarine attack in the hundreds of fields along the coast, mm -hmm. while acting as a fleet in being to draw the Royal Navy and later US Navy assets away from other operations in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. In addition to that, when the opportunity allows, using Luftwaffe air cover and U-boat support, the fleet could actually sail north in relative safety to engage on even terms with the enemy, and maybe they'd yeah, be able to the seriously disrupt the lend -Lease convoys, or even better, stop them completely. On January 14th, Tirpitz left Wilhelmshaven bound for Norway, and by the 17th, she had taken up residence in Fattenfjord near Trondheim, camouflaged alongside a cliff, surrounded by torpedo nets and an entire regiment of Luftwaffe AA guns, mm -hmm. as well as nearby fighter units. Mm -hmm. The crew even set up artificial fog machines using water and chlorosulfuric acid to obscure Tirpitz from aerial recon. In this position, she was relatively safe from air attack. Not that it would ever stop the Brits from trying, but you know, oh, measures yeah. need to be taken. Yeah. But of course, like with everything in the German military, fuel concerns, the constant drain on logistics caused by the Eastern and African fronts, as well as the northern passages being hard, if not impossible to navigate during winter, Tirpitz would not be called to act for a while. She would be stuck there her field. Also one of the most but her presence and location, and given to London by Norwegian resistance, was enough to cause serious alarm in Admiralty House and Number 10 yes, Downing. Yes, caused Winston Churchill to As down Churchill more famously said in his memoirs, before. the Battle of the Atlantic was the only thing Where's he truly feared the outcome of. <laughs> and like her big sister before her, Tirpitz posed an incredible threat. I gotta visit the Admiralty building. Scharnhorst, Gneisenau, and Prince Eugen were all currently in Brest Harbour being ruthlessly pummeled by the RAF. Yeah. But the escalating bomber campaign against Germany, spearheaded by Arthur, you can't retreat if I burn your streets, Harris, <laughs> was causing severe mission creep. And so there weren't enough assets to go around to do both missions. And so the bombing of Germany was taking precedence. Oh, yeah. They could, if the Germans really tried, they could make those capital ships ready for combat and sortie. However, at this point, unbeknown to the British, they actually had already fixed them and were about to escape to Norway via the English Channel by having balls you actually need a battleship to carry. Mm -hmm. But of course, as I said, the Brits don't know this yet. <laughs> they are also unaware of the mustachioed morons' No Atlantic Directive, so it was feared that with the Pacific and Mediterranean theatres eating up, the lend -Lease convoys to the USSR and the various other Imperial commitments, the Royal Navy would be spread thin enough to allow the Tirpitz to break out into the Atlantic and rendezvous with her cousins. If this happened... The bad old days of the U-boat's first happy time would be back with the vengeance, and this time they wouldn't have Prince of Wales, Repulse, Hood, or Ark Royal to deal with the problem. It was then, in the dark and dingy basements of Admiralty House London, that one of the newest members of the Chiefs of Staff Committee sat down. And this man was holding a folder. He had been appointed as the Chief of Staff for the newest branch of the British war effort, Combined Operations. <laughs> a command designed to unify army and navy will bring together all the unorthodox units formed by each branch to take the fight to Nazi occupied aka the unit of psychopaths who literally say here's a, we have a problem here we need to make that problem go away though we haven't been able to do it the traditional way so we need just the absolute most harebrained planning and schemes along with men with balls the size of fucking boulders to to fucking do and they're like okay here's what we got to do takes a hit from his crack pipe oh yeah these people were psychos and i love them Hollywood, make more movies about these guys. Like, I can't wait. I need to go see the the movie, uh, the 
the Department of Ungentlemanly Warfare. I need to go see that movie. Just to, just to see how crazy and hair-brained it is. By Europe. The SAS, the Special Boat Service, the Royal Marines, the Parachute Regiment, SOE, and of course, the Commandos. The man holding <sighs> this folder. His name was one Louis Mountbatten, 1st Earl of Burma, future Viceroy of India, Knight Commander of the British Empire and member of the Noble Order of the Garter, later uncle by marriage to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And dick a bit of a dick. To his friends. Just a little bit of a dick. And Lord Mountbatten Just ask the plan. Irish. And written on the front of that folder, two words. Operation Chariot. <laughs> When the Royal Navy had defeated Bismarck, it had been a very narrow affair. Had Ark Royal not done the naval equivalent of rolling a Nat 20 on their torpedo attack, she would almost certainly have gotten away yeah. and made it to Brest. Like I said, now, ultimate history, history scenarios aside, little things. needless to say, the British both during and after the war were convinced that Bismarck and her sister represented, if I may borrow the words of Tom Clancy, a clear and present danger to the war <laughs> effort. Perhaps even a fatal one, if coordinated effectively alongside the rest of the Kriegsmarine on the French Atlantic coast. So when they had defeated Bismarck, the way to, to be fair, to, to be fair, to what I mean, Nathan, is basically. So, to, just a little quick fact on these commandos and a lot of the special deep cover operations that happened during World War II. Like there were so many fucking special operations and plans, some of which we still don't know about because they're still locked up in the archives in the Great Halls of Britain or just completely forgotten and are still collecting dust in some cobweb-filled locker room. Just some of the plans and schemes, they're just like, they're insane! Like, take the, the plan, I forget the name of the operation off the top of my head, but it was, uh, they made two great movies about it, and it's one that, um, that a one Ian Fleming was a part of, and he took some inspiration for later novels, go check out James Bond, <gasps> where they literally found a, a, a man who had passed, who had died, a regular civilian, they dressed his, they dressed his corpse up in a military uniform, dumped him off the coast of Spain with, quote-unquote, secret documents the spanish people found him they gave their german their german friends the documents filled with all sorts of secret materials saying oh the british are going over here they sent all their troops over there to where the british where the, where the intel said the british were going to be and then the british went somewhere else entirely and actually had a successful operation thank you operation mince me thank you random thank you I'm a historian. I don't have a, a mind like a steel trap. Even we have to be reminded of things sometimes. I'm at least man enough to admit it. Yeah. Or there's the countless different pl ways that they plan to assassinate Hitler. There are so many way so many psychopaths then you've got the greatest raid ever where they literally packed a destroyer like they said let's see we have this old land lease destroyer from america it's not really that good anymore and we have a naval shipyard in france that's big enough to hold the bismarck class battleship we need to take it out bombing's not working so what do we do then they go well wh why don't we ask james he's the psychopath down the and he's not, and he's absolutely insane Okay, let's go talk to James. He says he has an idea. James, what do you have? <sighs> okay, listen. We take one of those destroyers and the Americans sent us. We pack it full of TNT, turn it into a floating bomb, and we ram it into the, into the fucking dry docks and make it go boom! James, that's insane. Let's do it. And they fucking did it! The fucking British Special Operations Executive, the SOE... Was did so much crazy batshit stuff that it is honestly Hollywood can make movie after movie after movie after movie of it. Honestly, 
little known about me. A little known about me. I'm a fan of classic movies. A lot of classic war movies. Like, a lo- like my favorite, one of my favorite movies ever will always be The Guns of Navarone, The Dirty Dozen. Uh, what's another good one? Well, both. both the, Force 10 from Navarone, Where Eagles Dare. Yeah, it's from Harmony God. <laughs> uh, what else? What, what, where else are some of my favorite movies? Valkyrie's one of my favorites. But, I, but uh, what I do like about, like, movies like... Dirty Dozen, Guns of Navarone, is that they, they didn't happen. But it just shows you some of the crazy lengths the British and the Allies went to complete objectives. Longest Day is good, but here's but I like the crazy commando movies because there's so much liberty you can take with commando movies. Like, they are some of the easiest movies to make, and they're just fun movies. Like, ser- like seriously, you, here's the plan. Germans got a secret weapon. What do we need to do? Send some crazy people to go take it out. Why? Why can't we just bomb it? Oh, because this is a secret bu- mountain bunker that's completely surrounded by anti-aircraft, the best units of the German army, and it's impenetrable. So that's why we need to send in commandos to take care of it. Did this ever fucking happen? Nope. Is it still fucking awesome as hell? Yes. So yeah, commandos. Absolute psychos, but they're fucking awesome. The way they'd managed it was critically damaging her and forcing her to turn back into the path of her hey, fleet. To Bismarck. But as said before, this was mainly due to luck. And should they be forced to fight Tirpitz in the same manner, the Germans may very well get away with it. That said, the Admiralty was certain that they had enough assets to contain and eventually confront Tirpitz, which of course they did. So all they needed to do was ensure that she couldn't escape from their clutches once they'd gotten her. Now with her modifications, Tirpitz was heavier than her big sister. And due to the damage done to Brest by the RAF, though hilariously they missed the three ships parked there and they made a break for it, the fact was apparent that this was just not a safe berthing either. No. This conveniently meant that there was only one oh, we're talking on the about it! Atlantic coast that had a dry dock and shipyard big enough like, to support her I was about, should she go. be damaged in combat. If this port was crippled or destroyed, Tirpitz would be forced to retreat to Germany past the British Isles, and ultimately get slaughtered. It was a port designed to build gigantic transatlantic cruise liners, primarily the SS Normandy, which gave the dock its name, the Normandy Dock. The town, meanwhile, has a name that anyone in history circles and special forces communities knows very well. The town of Saint-Nazaire, the site (laughs) of the greatest raid of all. That raid, of course, was Operation Chariot, and Combined Operations Command under Louis Mountbatten had come up with a plan that was so flat-out insane that many of the other members of the general staff thought he himself had lost it. In simple terms, the commandos, specifically two commando regiment with combat engineers from the other commando units, were to sail up the Loire River, go ashore in Saint-Nazaire, blow up the Normandy dock, blow up the pumping station and the dry dock gatehouse, including the winches and cranes, fight off the entire garrison of the Wehrmacht's 333rd Infantry Division, numbering 5,000 men, and then withdraw in PT boats up the river estuary they came down past 28 shore batteries, the coastal defence garrison, and all the searchlights supporting the 43 flat guns of various calibres guarding the port. Oh, and did I mention that this port also had a set of U-boat pens with their own security force, Luftwaffe units detailed to protect it, and the Kriegsmarine crews who all had weapons training in case of emergency. So yeah, they had to do all of this and get past 6,000 Germans in total. Only With 6, heavy 000. artillery for both anti-air and anti-ship, while also having air support guarding a high-value target. And at this point, I wouldn't even be shocked if there was a panzer unit on leave from the Eastern Front hanging around oh, somewhere. Oh yeah! Else, knowing how British luck usually goes. Or at least how it goes in September 1944. <laughs> This, quite frankly, this whole operation, so quite frankly, single, looks so impossible. Quick, for, uh, so and quick. if we are being... Come on, let's get it. So, here's the dock. Here's where they need to get. This is the dock that it is. Let's take a look at what we got here. We've got, I'm going to assume... Yeah, so look, we've got a pair of big caliber guns right here. You've got some standard medium in size guns here. More large batteries. You've got some other batteries right here, right here, right here, right here. Radar, 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 radar. Plus, the sub pens are about right here. 
This is what they have to sail up in and blow up this dock in the middle of Nazi-occupied France. Tell me that there's... So that you cannot tell me that the guy who came up on this was right in the head. <laughs> but you gotta love him. Being honest, it was. The planners had been trying to make this operation feasible, but it just wasn't working. They didn't need at least a thousand men to stand a chance of fighting off the Germans. Mm -hmm. But at most, they could get a couple hundred. Then there was how to blow- Also note this. Note this. Something else we learned in Laser Pig's video. This is- this is in- this is in- this is almost pretty much right after Dunkirk. The British army has so few weapons because all the Lee Enfields, all the shit they took with them to, Nor to fucking France, that was it. And then when they left at Dunkirk, they left it all behind. So basically, they had to get... The, their weaponry was a mishmash of old World War One relics, reserve, like weapons that were in storage, American bot... Or... Uh, b um, b American bot weaponry. Like Thompson's or sometimes some old Springfield's or that's pre or Lewis guns. These guys were basically saying, what do we got? I've got some duct tape and a pencil. What can we use this for? I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Blow up the dock gate. They had access to RDX and Composition B, but given the strength and size of the dock gate, that would involve the entire raiding force carrying two kilos of serious putty each and informing an orderly queue across the gate under fire from the entire German defense to the engineers who would then have to rig up the explosives one block at a time. Yeah, which... This whole impossible. plan was ludicrous and that's not even getting into the infiltration plan mm -mm. getting 30 or so patrol boats up river in the middle of the night without being noticed is dubiously hopeful at best and completely idiotic at worst oh yeah the germans couldn't fail to notice an entire schnellboat squadron going out on patrol and they would be equally likely to question one coming back for the night that they have no record of it was then the planners had a brainwave what if they didn't use serious putty, but bang powder, amatol, ammonium nitrate, and TNT together? And instead of infiltrating and then planting the bomb, how about infiltrating on the bomb? Rig a destroyer to look like one of the Z-class ships, fill it full of several tons of spicy flour, and then ram it into the dock gates. Once stationary, the raiding force dismounts from the ship and charges the defenders, blasting anything they can with angry Play-Doh while slaying Nazis like they hey, were an angry Polish-American man from favorites. a hit 1980s gaming franchise. Once done, they get on the PT boats who have now rushed down river to pick them up, and then straight back home in time for tea and medals. Then, a couple <laughs> of hours later, the destroyer will blow up, wrecking the target, and no more turbots in the Atlantic. Perfect. This plan was still batshit. Absolutely. Ah! Certified batshit insane! But at least it was now practical batshit. Practical batshit. The best practical kind batshit, of batshit! But practical nonetheless. <laughs> but High Command and the War Office still wasn't buying it. Take a good look, everyone. This is the group of psychotic escapees from the mental ward. Look at these beautiful psychos. These beautiful brain-dead morons who came up with the weirdest shit imaginable. You gotta love them! <laughs> However, Louis Mountbatten had a compelling argument. I remember he started the meeting by saying... Well, oh, Dickie, old cocky, you're prepared to lose all Love your it. sodas and all your ships. I suppose you can take on this task, which I regard as absolutely impossible. I said, it's the fact that it is regarded as impossible, which makes it possible. With reluctant approval from the Chiefs of Staff and predictable support from Winston can't get to Constantinople Churchill, mm. they had the green light. But only for half of what they needed. The RAF was supposed to launch a full-scale raid on the U-boat pens at the same time the attack was underway in order to suppress the defenders and distract them. But all the Air Chief Marshals were not willing to divert aircraft from their offensive operations against Germany proper, which is ironic given to how many assets they had already assigned to hitting Tirpitz directly. But, as was obvious, lateral thinking, it has to be said, 
was not Arthur denazification via conflagration Harris's strong suit. The Navy, meanwhile, balked at the idea of sacrificing one of their destroyers, not to mention risking their PT boat squadrons, when they were already pushed to the limit as it was. The fact that neutralizing tear pits would solve almost all of these problems was not enough of a mitigating factor to justify giving up their ships. The operation was looking to be bust before it had even started. However, with the backing of Number 10 and some strong negotiation from Mountbatten, the Navy acquiesced. They were given HMS Campbelltown, one of the destroyers provided to the British by the Bases for Destroyers Agreement with the United States. A 20-year-old Wix-class destroyer once named USS Buchanan, she had served as part of both the Royal Navy and the Dutch Navy protecting convoys in the Atlantic and along the African coast. Almost certainly bound for the scrapyard as soon as hostilities ended, oh, yeah. she was now going to go down in history, and she would do it by going out with a bang. The world's biggest bomb. Given her dimensions, bomb. she really couldn't be made to look like a Z-class destroyer. Yeah, she was too small. These destroyers were the common type found patrolling the Bay of Biscay and the Baltic. But she could be made to look like a Raubvogel-class torpedo boat. A kind of destroyer escort-sized vessel. Given they would launch the mission at night, this is going to have to do. But seeing as only six of these classes of vessels were ever built, and at this time they were mostly operating around the Channel Coast, it would only take one serious look and a quick phone call to blow their cover. But as long as the illusion held long enough until the last few minutes, it should only be has fine. To work until we're right up against Aiding the dock. in this was the fact that the code breakers at Bletchley Park, as well as some enterprising Royal Navy Thank sailors, God for Bletchley Park had managed to get a hold of baby. and subsequently work out Kriegsmarine code and security protocols, meaning that on the infiltration phase, the Campbelltown could signal back the correct answers to security challenges made by the shore batteries. They even had provisions for a ruse de guerre, a ruse of war flying a German ensign until the very last minute. The problem, the real problem, was the exfil plan. Yeah. The Navy had refused the lending of a second destroyer to pick the raid force up, and furthermore they had refused to assign a full unit of motor torpedo boats or PT boats. These assets were deemed far too valuable, and so instead they were supplied with 16 Fairmile motor launchers. These were unarmored, lightly armed with machine guns, and had auxiliary fuel tanks for the long mission, retrofitted onto the deck because yeah. having highly flammable material on the deck of an unarmored warship is a great idea made of wood my dear. worse still due to campbelltown being smaller than the destroyer they originally wanted a large component of the raiding force would have to go in on these boats as well as get out on them the math was pretty clear for most of the raiding party this trip was one way and they knew it. On March 26, 1942, went. the commandos and Royal Navy crews were given a final briefing. Louis Mountbatten himself gave it, and he finished it with a straightforward assessment of their chances. He told them that this mission was vital, but it was also most likely fatal, and that any man who wanted to back down now may do so without a stain on his honour or his character. All 621 men stepped forward they were going in the titanium balls to on these men the task force included all of the raid vessels including several torpedo boats plus two destroyers as escort and a submarine scouting ahead reaching the waters leading to the mouth of the loire river on the evening of march 27th they raised a german ensign and the raid force separated oh, yes, from we're, the rest german, we're german don't look too close while sailing towards the estuary U-Boat 593 spotted the force and immediately called it in. However, in the dark, they misjudged their movements, and so they radioed a flotilla heading southwest instead of east into the river. Maybe they were heading for Gibraltar or in transit to the Mediterranean. This confused the officer on the night watch. A rare turn of good luck, but unfortunately it would be the only one. At the same time, the much depleted RAF bombing raid began hitting Saint-Nazaire, the cloud layout was really, really low, and the conditions were awful, and the aircraft themselves were old Whitleys and Wellingtons, rather than the much more capable Sterlings and Halifaxes. And instead of launching a massed attack on the town in a traditional bomber stream, they orbited the area, dropping individual sticks of bombs on targets of opportunity, and generally making a nuisance of themselves. So instead Typical of a massive horror, yeah. air raid causing critical damage to the town and putting the Germans on alert, 
What happened was, a small group of 30 or so planes buzzed around, dropping the occasional bomb, being annoying. The problem was, of course, while this was distracting the Germans, it was also uncharacteristic of the typical British bomber stream behaviour. And so them doing this was like a single soldier walking up to the gates of a castle under siege, wearing an oversized suit of armour painted bright yellow, holding a gigantic sign with diversion written on it. The German commander immediately tweaked that these bombers were being weird. And as Murphy's Law has been ingrained into soldiers since the Roman Legion, if something on the battlefield is acting strange, it means a trap, it means ambush, or it means an enemy attack. And so he ordered the entire garrison of the, the town, the all 6,000 men, to move to action stations in preparation for a possible attack by what he suspected to be enemy paratroopers. The commandos at this point still had a shot, seeing as the Germans were looking the wrong way. But once they engaged, it wouldn't be a surprise. They would all be fully armed and ready for battle, <laughs> meaning it would instead be a strange form of meeting engagement. Certainly the most interesting form of meeting engagement. Yeah, sailing a bomb into a HMS harbor. Campbelltown and the motor launches began creeping their way up the river. The destroyer almost ran aground twice, but each time she scraped off the bottom. Given that she had four tons of super bleach located in the bottom of her bow, I would bet money that if you had given the crews cold butt plugs, you'd have a serious profit on diamonds by the end of that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Throw on a floating bomb and then you risk running aground. Oh my god. No, Man, you are clenched! <laughs> Nevertheless, these men with balls of titanium carried on until eventually their objective was in sight. In the darkness, they could just make out the dock. They were perhaps eight minutes away at good sailing, and then... Shit! We've been spotted, boys! Shit. The German searchlights surrounding San Nazaire lit up the entire river, exposing the flotilla. One of the lights next to the command bunker for the shore batteries flashed a challenge. One of the launches replied with the correct code phrase. A code phrase decoded and taken from a ship based in Norway last year. Shit. And in response to this, and other potential security leaks the Kriegsmarine were worried about, they had added a fourth rotor to their Enigma machine and changed their code books. Busted. The Germans immediately opened fire. The British signaled that they were friendly and this was a mistake, which bought them a minute or two, but this was almost immediately countermanded. Realising the situation... All the ships went to flank speed towards Full the Normandy dock gate, the Campbelltown bastards! raising the white ensign of the Royal Navy and beginning to blast what guns it did have straight back at the defenders. It was time to nut up or shut up. What followed was a slaughter. Oh, yeah. Being stuck in the narrow waterways of the Loire River, boxed in by friendly vessels and a gigantic floating bomb, the motor launch flotilla was forced to sail headlong through enemy fire without manoeuvring, and as a result, they were brutally cut down. Ten of them being blown to pieces or set ablaze before they even made it to shore. The Campbelltown, meanwhile, was getting hit by almost every calibre of gun in the German arsenal, with shellfire tearing holes in the hull and shrapnel killing both helmsmen. It was at this point that the explosives expert who set up the bomb, Nigel Tibbetts, took the wheel and under the con of the raid commander, Captain Stephen Beatty, they navigated around the pier which the commandos would be evacuated from post-mission, ostensibly, while narrowly avoiding the main harbour entrance and its lighthouse. This done, they were lined up directly on the dry dock gates, and with traces whizzing past, men dying, and their rides home burning, they pushed the engines to the limits and braced for impact. At 1.34am on the 28th of March 1942, Campbelltown rammed into the dry dock gates, and sure enough, on impact, the ship reared up and came to rest with the part of the hull containing the bomb exactly in the right spot on top of the target. And apparently, after stopping, Captain Beatty, as casually as though they were getting off a bus, was heard to say, Well then, chaps, here we are. The commandos immediately disembarked and began wreaking absolute havoc. As they Mayhem, do. Like carnage, the mad there are no they words were. to describe just how much damage a group of motivated special forces soldiers can do when they are on the attack with nothing to lose. The German defenders had a machine gun and flak emplacements on top of the U-boat pens and the pumping house overlooking the harbour, 
These were almost immediately silenced by mortars deployed from the few commandos who had survived landing in their motor launches. Then, a squad of 14 commandos, a mixture of northerners and Scots, dressed in their traditional kilts, stormed of course the they were! subsequently blowing it up. And then, the with bayonets Scots fixed, their... charged oh. across the bridge, leading into town in order to secure a way in to the other objectives for their comrades. Throughout the entire dockyard, anything of use to the Nazis was either being wrecked or blown up. <laughs> yeah. The torpedo boats even sunk two tankers in the harbour. Casualties on both sides, though, were absolutely horrendous. It was pretty soon obvious to everyone that it was time to bug out. However, only a third of the 620-man force was able to get away. And even then, many of them managed to get out into the bay, only to be sunk by the Creek's Marine on their way out of San Nazaire. While they were heading over to the target, they had heard reports of five German destroyer escorts operating nearby. And now, as the commandos tried to make a break for it in their small boats, those destroyers arrived on scene. One boat was intercepted by the German ship Jaguar, who immediately opened fire. The launch was torn apart, but during this fusillade, Sergeant Thomas Durrant of one commando regiment manned the Lewis gun mounted to the aft of the ship and began emptying drum after drum of ammunition. The Germans responded in kind, and the commando was wounded no less than six times. But despite the boat floundering and repeated calls to surrender, he kept firing until the entire ship's store of ammunition was expended. He then lost consciousness and died of his wounds. The Germans boarded the ship, taking the surviving crew prisoner. They would not be alone in this. After retreating into the town, the commandos who hadn't managed to get on one of the few remaining launches made a pact to make for Spain, and not to surrender until out of ammunition. And so they did. Eventually, five men would make it to the border and return to Britain. <laughs> 215 men were taken prisoner, and 169 were dead. But what of the mission? Well, despite popular belief, Neil Armstrong was not the first man on the moon. It was almost certainly a brave member of the Wehrmacht's 333rd Infantry. <laughs> because Campbelltown had been laying abandoned, wedged in the dock gate, and the Germans, thinking that it was a ramming attempt that had failed, begun picking over the ship for souvenirs and scouring the command cabins for intel. It was then, just as the clock struck midday, that the Amazon hull went off, blasting the dock open and eradicating anyone standing on it. Mm -hmm. The commandos Literally had Thanos done. snapped out of existence. Tirpitz was doomed to stay in Norway. And more top tier medals. And that's actually what was left, if I'm not mistaken. That is what was left of the Campbelltown after the fucking bomb went off. I mean, look at that. This is the dock that was going to hold her. And, and, th and they had to drag her in here and then try to repair the dock. It was flooded, so I'm assuming this is probably shot after the war. Medals for gallantry were handed out for this one raid than in any other battle of World War II. With one of them having a very unique twist. In 1945, when many of the citations were being submitted post-war by the survivors and prisoners of various actions, the application for a Victoria Cross came across the desk of a man in the war office. It was for a man named Sergeant Thomas Durrant, and this request was submitted by Lieutenant Colonel Newman, the commanding officer of two commando, captured during the raid of San Nazaire. But the letter of recommendation and the citation for the medal was not written by him. The recommendation for this VC, though submitted by Lieutenant Colonel Newman, was written and sent in by a man named Captain Lieutenant F. K. Paul, the former commander of the Kriegsmarine ship Jaguar. The captain of the German destroyer who sunk Sergeant Thomas Durrant's motor launch nominated him for the Victoria Cross. It is one thing to be recognised for gallantry by your own men, it is quite another that when your enemy declares witness to your bravery. And this act When of your enemy says, That man fought like a demon! Give that man a medal! You know you are a boss. Sacrifice was but one of many that evening. And it had ensured that the Kriegsmarine flagship would not threaten the Atlantic. However, the threat she posed to the Arctic convoys was something else entirely. Yes! And with winter now over, and the sea lanes open, 
the Royal Navy was about to find out just how much of a threat she could be. Mm -hmm. Not just in her own strength, but in how much fear she could instill into them. Oh, yeah. Tirpitz may be the lone queen of the North, but anyone from the polar regions can tell you. In the darkness of the night, you are never alone. Because one thing is always certain. In your darkest hour, the wolf pack is drawing near. All throughout 1942, at the same time Operation Chariot was being planned and carried out, the Kriegsmarine in Norway had been trying, and so far failing, to cripple the Allied convoys to the USSR, yeah. known by their designations PQ and QP. PQ was outbound to Russia, and QP meant they were heading back to Blighty. Mm -hmm. In February, Scharnhorst, Gneisenau, and Prince Eugen had run the gauntlet of the English Channel, only for all of them to Not be- Not now. It was pronounced nice now. Jesus. And before anyone starts trying to correct me, my grandmother was German. She act- and, and here's a cool fact. Cool fact about my grandmother. Cool fact about my grandmother. Rest her soul. She grew up in Germany around this time, and she actually was given the ch opportunity to toy the nice now. That's right. When she was a little girl- before the war happened, she had her opportunity to go aboard the Nisenau. And she was on that ship. She saw it before the war. And it was pronounced Nisenau. Not Gun Nisenau. Jesus Christ. Nisenau. That was the only way she ever said it. So that's, in my opinion, is worth more than anything. So, ha! Don't try and correct me. Because then you're correcting my grandmother. And she was German! ...be critically damaged. The battleships by mines and Oikid ran afoul of a submarine and then got <laughs> bombed again. Mm. In fact, as mentioned before, she has probably the only German ship bombed more than our main lady here. Although she is cheating a little bit given the last bomb that hit her was a bit... ...excessive. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, poor Prince Oikid. Here comes the sun. Doo -doo. Why'd they have to drop a new But despite bomber? all this firepower being moved to Norway, it had a rather detrimental effect on the operational capability of the Kriegsmarine. In fact, it was a bit of a bust given that all three fleet units were now down for repairs and all the escorts had been shifted to France to help them get here. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue of it all was that the fuel expended by the move had robbed the Northern Task Force yeah. of their reserve. However, they still had their primary tanks full and ready for use. Mm. And when Luftwaffe Recon spotted two large convoys in their area of operations, one heading out and one heading back, QP-8 and PQ-12, it was decided that Tirpitz should see her first action. The Kriegsmarine named it Operation Sportspalast, named after the giant indoor stadium in Berlin where Dr. Cockgobbler, the poison dwarf, made all of his propaganda. <laughs> On March 5th, 1942. <laughs> I've never heard that one. I'm keeping that one. Oh my god, that's hot. <laughs> that's the best way for Dr. G for fucking Dr. <laughs> Dr. Oh, that's good. 
1942, Tirpitz, followed by her escorts, sailed out to intercept the convoys. But the Allies were listening what? in. I'm petty in the, While the Greek the Marine had taken security measures, Tirpitz required National Command right. Authority, that being the Fuhrer himself, and so standard OKW channels were used. Thus, the convoys were rerouted north. Mm-hmm. But it was even worse for the Germans, as unbeknownst to them, Home Fleet had been along for the ride, and so renowned Duke of York, KG-5, and Victorious were nearby, waiting for Tirpitz to overextend. But the Germans had learned their lesson by now, and upon learning that the convoys had evaded them, they withdrew. And so by March 8th, the Kriegsmarine was back in its fjords. It was incredible just how effective the Norwegian coast line be at allowing navies to wage what was essentially guerrilla warfare. In fact, the added effect of their rock faces and their steep cliffs meant that the effects of Allied air power had been completely mitigated. Oh, God damn it! Holy shit, they missed. Man, those guys could use some pathfinders or something. I don't know, actually, maybe an elite squadron of specialists might help. Nah, with Arthur Harris in charge, that's never going to happen. And the business, we called us foreshadowing. <laughs> but to cut a long story short, the fleet air arm from Victorious had launched a raid with her air group while Tirpitz was returning to base, only for the battleship to evade every single torpedo and bomb. Then the RAF bombed her anchorage not once, but twice, with around 40 modern four-engine bombers each time, Lancasters and Halifaxes. And they all missed, while losing several aircraft to the AAA defences. But the Germans had the same old problem. No gas. They had rushed three ships to Norway, only to have them all knocked out, and then two went after convoys, missed both, and then had to run for their lives from the Royal Navy's two most modern battleships and an aircraft carrier. Yeah. And all they had to show for it was a single merchant ship sunk by a destroyer further down the coast, while the escorts were chasing Tirpitz. So they had burned all that fuel... Thousands of tons of it, in fact, Vana. the lifeblood of the oil-starved Germany, and achieved what their new American enemies politely called diddly squat. I am ah. Australian, though, so they'd achieved fuck all. <laughs> fuck all. Hey, we use that too. Months, three whole months to rebuild their reserves, and by now even the Germans realized that what they had was not was a battleship, just, we're talking but rather a heavily armed seaside hotel. Not the guy. And there is some irony in the fact that this seaside hotel full of imperialists was being bombed by the RAF instead of the IRA. God damn! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Couldn't help myself. I'm not a big fan of Margaret Thatcher, as you can guess. Man, the comments on this one are going to be fun. Anyway, uh, thanks. I'm getting roped. It is into now that June too. 1942. The Allies have gotten back in the saddle regarding intelligence gathering and picked up communications afraid. regarding a new operation against the Arctic convoys. Operations Knights Move. The Germans, having replenished their oil reserves, were now ready to make another attempt, and this time they were determined that it shouldn't fail. But of course, this is the Creek's Marine Surface Fleet, and as we all know, things never go to plan. Especially when they're involved. Mm-hmm. Then again... They were about to take a leaf out of the British playbook. Sometimes you can fail upwards. The U-boat force running picket in the Denmark Strait had been positioned in order to alert Admiral Raider when the next Arctic convoy departed for Archangel. Meanwhile, the surface force was the largest the Germans could muster. Tirpitz was accompanied by Admiral Hipper, Admiral Scheer, Lutzo, and had 12 destroyers in attendance. They would be backed up by Luftflotte 5, with 240 aircraft at their disposal for both recon and airstrike capability. Like most German battle plans, it had margins for error, contingencies built in, and a backup for the backup. It was operational art. But of course it had two fatal flaws. Tirpitz, as said before, is a National Command Authority asset, meaning the Bohemian Corporal himself had to authorise each phase of the plan, and... Like all German plans, while great, the first phase is reliant on predicated information being correct yeah. and surprised to be achieved. If that intelligence is faulty, which when dealing with the Allies it usually is, I mean, look <laughs> up Operation Double Cross, it's hilarious, it's a fun read. 
The entire plan is meaningless if those predications aren't correct. The German fleet units were based in the more secure southern regions of Norway, closer to home waters. The plan was that as soon as the U-boats got confirmation that the convoy was en route, the task force would quickly redeploy to northern Norway, refuel, and then sortie to engage the enemy. To avoid enemy air attack, they would sail in between the fjords and coastal islands, and then once in open sea, they would directly intercept the convoy and sink the escorts. Once done, they would then sink the merchants, and in one fell swoop, they would deprive the Allies of some of their capital ships while damaging the Soviet war effort, and most of all, hitting Allied morale while boosting their own. All they needed now was a convoy. That convoy came on June 27th, 1942. Convoy designation PQ-17. For the Germans, as is tradition by now, things went wrong almost immediately. The U-boat pickets in the Denmark Strait missed the convoy in its entirety, and it wasn't until the 1st of July that one of the subs getting ready to relieve one of the boats already out there spotted the convoy. U-456 immediately radioed a contact report and then shadowed the convoy, guiding Luftwaffe aircraft into the target. The German Maritime Patrol Squadrons launched aircraft and maintained contact as well, and by July 2nd, convoy PQ-17 was fully plotted. It then got even more complicated for the Allies, as one of the returning convoys, QP-13, was ordered to use the convoy as a screen, given that PQ-17 was being escorted by one of the toughest battle groups on the seas. Duke of York and Victorious were present, along with a substantial cruiser force, including HMS Sirius, and best of all, the US Navy had finally arrived in the European War, and they had sent along none other than USS Washington. HELL YEAH! Yeah. The Allies meant fucking business. But by now, the convoy had gotten in range of the Luftwaffe's anti-shipping squadrons. The shit show has begun. Oh, I... The first wave of bombers were ineffective, an attack comprised of nine aircraft achieving nothing except alerting the Allies that the Germans had now made contact and were aware of their presence. Admiral Raider, meanwhile, informed De Führer, requesting permission to deploy Tirpitz and her cousins, which he immediately got. Problem was, as we've established, they were days late due to only just getting the word on the 1st of July. It wasn't until 8pm on the 2nd that Turbots and her battle group sailed, with the cruisers and destroyers leaving at midday on the 3rd. To maintain stealth, they proceeded through the various islands and shoals on the Norwegian coast in order to get as close as possible before initiating contact with PQ-17. This resulted in three of the destroyers running aground, quickly to be followed by Lutze forcing them to return to base. Things were not going well. Nope. And then, as they often do, things got worse. Specifically two things. First was updated orders from the OKW, specifically from the Fuhrer himself. Due to the potential damage to morale, losing Tirpitz would cause, the force was ordered not to engage any Allied capital ships. The fact that this invalidated the entire operational concept, as well as precluded them from taking decisive action, doesn't seem to have occurred to him. The second was something we the viewers are used to, but they were blissfully unaware of. The Allies found out they were coming, losing them the element of surprise. However, in a twist of tragic irony that so often happens in war, the fact that the mission was compromised is what allowed it to succeed. Admiral Tovey and the capital ships from home fleet, along with USS Washington, were shadowing PQ-17, knowing that Tirpitz and her cousins were planning on accepting battle. It was now the 4th of July. First blood had been struck by the Luftwaffe, who had disabled the Liberty ship SS Christopher Newport, allowing it to be finished off by U-457. Then later that night, a squadron of 25 torpedo bombers hit the convoy again, sinking the SS William Hooper. These losses, combined with the knowledge that essentially the entirety of Germany's available capital ships were heading their way, made things rather tense at Admiralty House. There were conflicting reports regarding Tirpitz's location, as well as the potential U-boat and Luftwaffe threats. There was also another critical factor. This was the first major naval cooperation between the US Navy and the Royal Navy. If the Germans got amongst American destroyers and cruisers, they could have a massacre, which would damage relations between the Allies, and seriously hurt US morale, which, given their recent victory at Midway, was riding high. 
Losing that buoyancy from the public would be seriously not good. And so conflicting orders were sent out. Basically saying, protect the convoy, but at the first sign of trouble, withdraw. Admiral Tovey, meanwhile, was under the impression that Tirpitz coming to fight was exactly what they wanted. With carrier support and two of the best battleships in the world, not to mention a huge cruiser squadron, they could defeat the Kriegsmarine and remove the threat permanently. This was a conflicting tactical assessment, and that meant that should Tirpitz be sighted, half the escorts would fight, the other half would run away. But worst of all, the merchants would scatter to evade the surface raiders, leaving them completely unprotected against U-boats and aircraft. It was then they received a signal. Tirpitz and Admiral Scheer, along with their escorts, were underway north. Convoy is to scatter. At 22.15, PQ-17 broke up, running east as fast as they could. But as they did so, the cruisers and destroyers withdrew west. The merchants were defenceless. Admiral Tovey, meanwhile, kept his formation together and moved to put himself between Tirpitz and the convoy. The Germans, meanwhile, pushed north. They had heard reports from their recon assets that the convoy had scattered in fear of their advance, and hence they doubled down, pushing everything they had into the area. U-boats and aircraft began sortieing as fast as they could go, while the destroyers and cruisers moved to head off the convoy at the Northern Cape. Without escorts, they would be easy pickings. But as for Tirpitz's group, once again, the Fuhrer's authorization was required, and so it wasn't until 3pm on July the 5th that the flagship and her cousins were given authorization to carry out their mission. Almost as soon as they left their anchorage at Altenfjord, they were spotted by the Soviet submarine K-21, mm. under the captain of Captain Nikolai Kunin, hero of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. who engaged with torpedoes at long range. He reported two hits, however these were most likely the warheads automatically detonating once out of fuel, as Tirpitz didn't suffer any damage. What did matter, though, was he made a contact report and as he was operating near home waters, and the Allies were nearby, he made that contact report in clear. Meaning his report was picked up by the Kriegsmarine listening posts. Oh, now the Germans were aware that their mission was compromised, and as such, Raider, following orders from the OKW not to risk the flagship, turned about and withdrew. But by this time, the damage was done. Yeah. Over the course of the next several days, the merchants, forced to go it alone, were systematically hunted down and quite frankly murdered. Just some of the transmissions received by the Admiralty were horrifying. Under attack by entire squadron of planes. On fire in the ice, abandoning ship. And this one actually gives me chills. Group under attack by six U-boats attacking on the surface. They stared a wolf pack down knowing that they were completely helpless. Of the 34 ships that had left for Russia as part of PQ-17, 23 were sunk. This devastating disaster forced the Allies to suspend Arctic convoys for two months, severely damaging Allied Soviet relations. Meanwhile, Fleet Admiral Ernest King, who quite openly detested the British, held First Sea Lord Dudley Pound personally responsible for the disaster, and as a result, withdrew Task Force 39 from the Arctic. This, of course, would be why USS Washington and USS Wasp were around for the naval battle of Guadalcanal. It remained one of the costliest Allied defeats of World War II. The Germans, meanwhile, were jubilant at its success. But it was not Raiders' success. On the contrary, it was Dernitz's success. A U-boat arm had proved that given the right conditions and with proper air support, they could slaughter Allied I Germany, I A vindication of the wolf push pack. For the Kriegsmarine surface force had sortied, lost half its ships to accidents, <coughs> and then ran away, burning up yet more fuel they really didn't have. Combine this with the defeat in the Battle of the Barents Sea, a small surface engagement which took place on New Year's Eve 1942, the Kriegsmarine surface force was relegated to being a fleet in being permanently, by express order of the Fuhrer himself. The U-boat arm would now be the main German fleet effort across all theatres, and all future resources allocated to the Navy would go to them. 
which of course resulted in Admiral Raider resigning from his post, making way for Dernitz. As all this drama played out though, the British were fuming. They were indignant. And well, they were. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm usually far more composed. I'm just a little bit absolutely livid. <laughs> this disaster had convinced them now more than ever. Tirpitz had to be destroyed by any means necessary. No matter how crazy the scheme. And as we've established last chapter, if there's one thing the Brits can do, it's a crazy scheme. No, After the success of PQ-17, though indirect, Tirpitz was forced to pull back for maintenance. The wear and tear of her few deployments had taken a toll on the ship, and a major overhaul was required. She returned to her original anchorage near Trondheim, and began the process. The number of defences put in place to protect her was frankly ridiculous. They double layered the torpedo nets, extra flak batteries were installed both on the ship itself and in the surrounding fjord. Oh, yeah. At this point, this particular piece of Norway was more gun than fjord. <laughs> really. Oh, yeah. The overhaul was, was done in hedgehog. stages, even, so that Tirpitz was technically still operational in some capacity, and at any time, except during the middle of replacing her rudders, she was ready to drop everything and fight. It was during this period on October 1942 that the British tried Crazy Scheme Part 1, <laughs> namely using Chariot Mark I manned torpedoes, Based on a similar Italian design, which had caused some havoc in 1941. Incredible, the Italians actually achieved something. Unfortunately, they weren't very practical in the Time rough waters for some of the North walls Sea. Is that when the fishing boat towing them hit bad weather, the line snapped and the mission was a bust. But to be honest, riding those torpedoes past the elevated security and around the two torpedo nets is a dubious proposition at best. Yeah. But in true keep calm and carry on spirit, this was treated as a setback rather than a failure of concept. It didn't fail. So they went back it to the drawing board, and in their time of need, the War Office and the experimental weapons teams came up with something more suitable. The famous X-Craft Midget Ah, uh, yes! Designed to sneak up on ships at anchor, allowing the crew to place mines. But it would take time to build enough for a mission and train the crews to do it. Plus, they needed to find naval officers mad enough to volunteer for it. So they did what the British Navy always does in situations like this, they grab a few notably eccentric Royal Navy officers to lead the mission, and then call Scots, Aussies, and Kiwis because we're the only ones stupid enough to try it. <laughs> Here, yeah, basically the British Navy. Okay, we have a we have a harebrained scheme and a crazy suicidal mission. Who do we get? Well, let's look through the naval records. Let's find out who's an individual and who isn't a tea sucker. Let's see here. Let's see. Stiff upper lip. Very kind. Very polite. Very polite. Very polite, gentlemanly. Oh, here's a guy. He picks his nose and he curses quite often. Get him. <laughs> Slapped an officer. Him too. Oh, 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 oh my. Oh, oh, oh lord. Oh, it, it's still going. Oh lord. Um, okay, yeah, him. A and what of the crew? Get the colonials in on this. Th those fuckers are insane. <laughs> Do we have a pref do we have a preference, sir? Yes, the Kiwis, the Scots, and the fucking Australians. If those fuckers are crazy enough to fight a fucking bird, then they'll be mad enough to fight a battleship with a fucking pocket knife. <laughs> yeah, do not fuck with British colonials. They will fuck shit up. They call it Operation Source. And prepared in ah uh, speaking of and one of our favorite speaking of col mad colonials it's a canadian ladies and gentlemen tribal has arrived here yes the fucking canadians are here hey tribal i got a mission for you want to go fight a battleship with a pocket knife and a bear and a hand grenade <laughs> so 1942 came to a close <laughs> the raf showed up once or twice but on the whole Nothing also, much fuck you, you traitor. The Royal Navy You're kept the one that plotting. Made me do this. The Kriegsmarine kept overhauling. 
The Wehrmacht got themselves stuck in a city on the Volga River with a Uranus infection. <laughs> while the Americans stole an island off the Japanese thanks to a very, very, very angry aircraft carrier and her crew. Everything, for the moment at least, was in its proper place. Mm -hmm. Half a year goes by. Yeah, we're skipping ahead because nothing happened between then and now. <laughs> yeah, wild, right? Tons of shit went down this year. Operation Torch leading to victory in Africa. Mm -hmm. The campaign in Sicily and Italy kicking off. Victory on Guadalcanal. The Battle of Kursk. Shit was crazy. Oh, yeah. But nothing much regards the Kriegsmarine actually happened, especially where Tirpitz is concerned. Mm -hmm. Although, there was one weird thing that did happen. A bunch of some absolute mad lads pulled off this crazy air raid. They managed to fly heavy bombers across Europe at like 60 feet and blew up the dams in the Ruhr Valley with bombs that bounced. No kidding, this shit was wild. Oh yeah. But thankfully we managed to patch up the damage and get production back online, so overall shouldn't be an issue. For now. For now. <laughs> anyway, as I said, lots of sitting in fields. So, TLDR. It's a joke, Sean Horst Nathan, is here now. Dernit says we have to do something to restore yeah. faith in the Navy. Arctic convoys aren't happening right now. And we have a large garrison of troops based here in Norway in preparation for an allied invasion that is definitely coming, because the Fuhrer says so. And thus, the Kriegsmarine organized an operation. An operation called Lemon Flavor. I reckon Miho's in charge of this one. No! Oh, don't insult Miho like that! No, I'm not kidding. Operation Lemon Flavor. Oh. An operation where Tirpitz and Scharnhorst, with the destroyer flotilla alongside, would bombard the Allied weather station on Spitsbergen in the Svalbard archipelago, allowing for some of the troops freezing their ass off in Norway to actually do something by mounting a raid. The garrison on this island was only a small number of free Norwegian troops, so it shouldn't be too hard. And with the Allies not pushing convoys through at the moment, we don't really have to worry about home fleet or the RAF interfering with it. And so, as September 1943 began, this task force set off, arriving at the target on the 8th of September 1943 at 3am. Tirpitz sailed in, rather unnecessarily in my opinion, flying the white ensign of the Royal Navy, a ruse de guerre of their own, and began signalling the shore that they were friendly paying a shore visit. While they were doing this, the German infantry units began landing in the bay from the destroyers. The Norwegians, though, taking a look at the ships out in the bay, realised that their paint scheme looked a little off. Also, the turrets looked a little bit weird. Oh, shit! Oh, my God! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody stay fucking calm! Stay fucking calm! Wait, 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 wait! wait, wait, wait. Calm down! <laughs> the weather station immediately transmitted an SOS to Iceland. Please help, the Nazis are here. Tabitz's radio operators picked this up, and seeing that their cover was blown, decided, fuck it, well, they know we're here now, and opted for full send. Oh. Oh, God. Less than a minute after that transmission was reported, Tabitz fired blasting the broadcasting tower and the associated radio shack to absolute smithereens. <laughs> the infantry, now ashore, began their advance under the cover of the naval bombardment. Scharnhorst and the destroyers were now getting in on this act and pummeling the shoreline as well. But as was their habit, the Norwegians, like their Viking ancestors, put out a lot more damage per capita than most people do. And those absolutely insane, like these guys Don't are stupidly the brave. These stupidly brave Scandinavians turned their 40mm Bofors guns not on the advancing German infantry coming up the beach. No, 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 no. They turned their 40mm Bofors AA guns on the destroyers out to sea. And they went ham. The <laughs> Z29 and Z33 were damaged, the latter being so serious they required a tow. They decided it was prudent to get the fuck out of Dodge, which they did. Unfortunately for the Norwegians, this left a clear line of fire for Tirpitz, who, with her world-class Zeiss rangefinders, zeroed on the gun positions to within an inch, and then sent a full broadside of both primary and secondary batteries into their positions, 
blowing the Bofors guns away along with their crews. With the aid of her Arado 196 float planes, Tepitz and Scharnhorst methodically blasted every military target in the area with ruthless precision. Absolutely horrible, but you have to admit this. You have to be. You have to admit this. Do you know, do you understand how big a nuisance you have to be to have a fuck the Europe's most powerful battleship at the time focus its entire main battery on you? How how much of a fucking boss do you have to be? Like. The battleship commander goes, our destroyers are running. Who's doing it? That little anti-aircraft battery right there. What, those guys? Fuck, their level must be over 9,000. Put the 15 inchers on these fuckers. <laughs> Put the 15 inchers on them. Put some 15 inch shells on them. Put five stars on them. <laughs> the Wehrmacht unit, meanwhile, overpowered the garrison, taking prisoners and setting explosives on anything they couldn't steal. And once they did this, they took stock of the situation. Fuck. The raid commander aboard Tirpitz made the call to bug out. The time was now 11am, and seeing as the garrison got a message out, he had a genuine concern that the Royal Navy home fleet would be even now steaming towards them with murderous intent. In fact, he was absolutely right. The only downside is that they were in Scarpa Flow, and by the time they had sailed, the Germans were long gone, and had returned back to the fjord from whence they came. <laughs> but of course, the British knew exactly which fjord it was, and as luck would have it, all they would need for is for them to stay exactly where they were for the next two weeks. Though with the fuel shortage this was probably rather inevitable anyway. Because by now, the colonial reprobates and the British madmen in their ridiculous submarines <laughs> We're ready to roll. And now, with the set- Those madmen and their submarine machines. Jesus Christ, that's a fucking movie. That needs to be a fucking movie. The crazy British, the the absolute bomb-carrying subs, and the crazy-ass colonials. That's a movie title. That knowledge that Terpus would be in her birthing, thanks to said recent operation burning her fuel and intelligence from the Norwegian resistance watching her, Operation Source was ready to go. And so the operation began on September 20th, 1943. A squadron of fleet submarines were assigned to transport the six X craft and their crews out to the raid launch point. Once there, they would deploy and infiltrate the fjord. Then while inside, they would deploy mines near the hulls of Lutzo, Tirpitz and Scharnhorst. And if all goes according to plan, the damage would sink them at their moorings at worst, and at best, do enough damage to put them out of action permanently. Mm -hmm. But as with all experimental missions, things ultimately began to unravel. X-9, detailed to attack Lutzo, broke her tow line. Given that she had been trimmed for a dive to counter rough seas over the bow, upon the line breaking she dove radically, damaging the controls and taking her below crush depth with all the men on board. Then X-8 developed leaks in her demolition charges, forcing them to be jettisoned. The shock of their release set the charges off, crippling the sub and very nearly killing the crew. Mercifully, they managed to get off the ship, but it was forced to be scuttled. Not a very auspicious start, and it only got worse. Yes. Scharnhorst had been undergoing they refits as well, worse. and on the night of the attack, the 22nd of September, she was out on exercise doing sea trials. Though it may have been just as well, seeing as on the way to target, X-10, the submarine detailed to attack her, was forced back due to mechanical issues, which in turn caused navigational errors. That only left three X-Craft, X-5, X-6, and X-7, to carry out the mission. They crept through the field, maintaining stealth and arming their weapons. X-5, commanded by Lieutenant Henry Creer, led the raid in swinging around in front of Turpitz's bow. They approached the torpedo nets, preparing to breach the perimeter, and then... Boys, we've been spotted! Tepitz's hydrophone set picked up X-5. The ship's searchlights flashed on, and the men stood too, sprinting to their action stations and gun positions. Destroyer escorts in the field running their evening patrol immediately began triangulating her location and armed their depth charges. Though those depth charges would be deployed, 
they were unnecessary. Having tracked the target, Turpitz trained her forward battery on X-5's approximate location and fired. The shock damage in the water shattered the sub's hull, ending the lives of the crew aboard. But all of this commotion gave X-6 and X-7 an opening. Sneaking past the torpedo nets, both subs deposited their mines beneath Turpitz's hull and immediately began their withdrawal. Hoping the explosions from the depth charges as well as the commotion on deck facing X-5 would give them the same cover for their exfil. Unfortunately, the crew aboard the German flagship was by now a team of experienced professionals rather than the pale-faced youths of 1941. Yeah. Spotting the two subs making a break for it, they directed fire from the secondary and AA batteries onto them, while the destroyers swung around with depth charges. Two of the crew aboard X-7 were killed during this, while X-6 was critically damaged, promptly being captured. It had been about half an hour or so by this point since their attack commenced, and as the senior naval officer present, Tabitz's commander, Hans Meyer, ordered the prisoners aboard his ship to be interrogated. This, for reasons that are obvious, made the Allied sailors a tad nervous. After all, they'd just planted bombs under the ship they were now sitting on. But after doing the math in his head, Lieutenant Donald Cameron worked out that even if Tirpitz tried to escape now, it would be too late. And so, in typical Scottish fashion, he told the Germans exactly what was about to happen. Probably with a shit-eating grin on his face. <laughs> sure enough... Yeah, I'm pretty sure the, the conversation went just like this. Oh, well, you see, uh, below you we planted a bunch of bombs. They have enough firepower to completely blow the ship halfway to the moon. That's what we did. And they should be going off any second now. I'd start swimming if I were you. Yeah. <laughs> engines fired up and raised anchor. Two huge explosions rocked the ship. One forward near the port bow. The other one aft next to sea turret. The damage was catastrophic. One of the main field tanks ruptured entirely. While the armor plate in the affected regions were torn in multiple places. Multiple bulkheads failed, while the double hull was compromised with a huge indentation being blown into the bottom of the ship. This damage caused critical flooding. Over 1,400 tons of water rushed into the compromised hull, causing a two-degree list while wrecking all of the turbo generators in two of the generator rooms, while rupturing all of the steam lines on the ship and severing the primary power cables. Both AR-196 float planes were aggressively disassembled into component parts, and worst of all, D turret was thrown clear of its bearings, which was a serious problem as there was not a single crane in Norway strong enough to lift it. Tirpitz was crippled. crippled. The only thing stopping her from sinking was the fact that most of the damage was done to one side. That, and as we know, the Bismarck class can take an obnoxious amount of brute force trauma, but she sure as hell wasn't going anywhere for a really long time. Both surviving commanders of the raid Lieutenant Basil Place and Donald Cameron rightfully got the Victoria Cross, <laughs> while their crews both got DSOs and conspicuous gallantry medals. Once again, another do-or-die harebrained scheme led by the maddest men of the British Empire had kept Tirpitz at bay. But, but the Northern alive. convoys wouldn't be safe until she was gone for good. Mm -hmm. She's hurt. They were going to need some but specialists. But now she's pissed. The army specialists had taken down her main dry dock. The Navy specialists had crippled her, fixing her in place. This left one team of experts to handle the biggest job of all. It was time. It was finally time. The RAF was going to settle accounts and get serious. Yeah. And so many a phone call was made across through the war office, through Number 10 Downing Street, through RAF command... All the phone calls were made until, finally, a ringing sound could be heard in the operations room of RAF base Scampton in Lincolnshire. The phone was answered quickly and simply with a crisp greeting. Operation 617 Squadron. Oh, let me tell you something. Boston makes me feel good. It's the damn Busters, baby! This is a program. Oh, they were so lucky. 
this is their damn busted. I Despite you. appearances, it was evident from lessons learned in the Pacific and from the ASW pilots currently annihilating Dennis's U boat force mm-hmm. from Ireland to Iceland to Newfoundland that the age of the conventional Navy was at an end. Yeah. It would be air power and force multipliers working in tandem with high tech destroyers and cruisers that would carry the day, not the battle wagons and torpedo boats of yore. But with repairs being completed, Tirpitz was still a major threat to Allied forces in the northern waters. Yep. Not to mention the possibility of a do-or-die charge into the Baltic to support ground troops currently retreating along the coastline towards East Prussia, much like Prince Eugen would end up doing. Mm. The German repair ship Neumark had achieved what many considered an unsung engineering miracle, getting Tirpitz back into the fight by April of 1944. And with resolve in their hearts, the crew on, once again prepared to. For the love of God, we just fixed it! Wait. That's not the Greta here. That's hard of. Oh shit! Oh sh- The fleet air arm. Really? Christ, it was bad enough last time. <sighs> What's the damage? What's it? Well, at least they didn't manage to penetrate the main armor, but look at our superstructure. It's trashed. It's going to take another several months to patch all these holes. Not to mention we're going to have to get another couple hundred men to replace the ones we just... Wait, both of our float planes as well? We just fixed them. We didn't even test fly the starboard oh, one. And two secondary batteries too? God, this is getting expensive. It's coming! Oh no. No, 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 Again? Again. Come on, guys. This isn't funny. Okay, maybe it's a little funny from where you're sitting, but we literally just fixed this. Um, although, I mean, the damage isn't too bad. Only one bomb hit us, and that was a dud. Wait, it was an armor-piercing bomb? Where did it end up? The switchboard room. <laughs> fucking wonderful. You're telling me we have to use the communications tubes and runners? <laughs> well, this is just fan- This repair work is going to go well, isn't it? This is going to be- cr- Oh, come on! <laughs> you guys done? You guys done? Nope! You're not. Just stop, alright? You aren't even hitting us properly. Just stop. This is getting embarrassing. Like, we're still afloat. Can you guys just leave us alone? Just give us a minute. I mean, this isn't even hurting. It's just goddamn annoying. Yeah. <laughs> right, fuck off, all of you. Over the course of 1944, the Royal You're Navy done? Fleet Air Arm, with their carrier force led by Victorious and Formidable, battered Tirpitz with raid after raid. In fact, as demonstrated by the previous gag, no less than six raids were launched. Carriers furious and indefatigable also lend their aircraft to this endeavour, along with a literal pick. shipload of escort carriers. Sorry, I couldn't help myself, guys. Their operations names were pretty good too. Operations Tungsten, Planet, Brawn, Mascot, Tiger Claw, and Goodwood. The naval version of Operation Goodwood. And they represented repeated attempts by the Royal Naval Air Service to finish the job started by the Silent Service. But alas, to no avail. This would, after all, end up requiring the heavy bombers of the RAF to accomplish. And by now, they had some specialists with special weapons to handle just such a job. 617 Squadron was formed in 1943 at RAF Scampton, led by the famous Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Oh, God! They were never intended to become the Special Forces equivalent in air operations, it just sort of happened by accident, as they kept fulfilling that role after their initial mission. You see, as alluded to in the previous chapter and as the title of this chapter shows, as all of you watching are most likely aware, 617 Squadron was formed from the best crews across all of Bomber Command, handpicked personally by Guy Gibson 
and by the Air Ministry staff. Oh, yeah. And they were The reason for this squadron was kept lads. incredibly secret until the assistant chief designer of Vickers Armstrong, Barnes Wallace, had completed his tests. It was then revealed that the purpose of the squadron was the destruction of the great dams scattered along the Ruhr Valley in Germany. Oh, yeah. The Ruhr region, thanks to its huge natural water supply and central location in Europe, was a massive industrial powerhouse stretching along the entire German West Frontier. It churned out pretty much the entirety of Germany's steel production, along with God knows how many weapons plants of various types. It held the main operations of all major arms operations in Germany, oh, yeah. such as Rheinmetall, Krupp, Dyson, MAN, Porsche, and numerous others, not to mention a large population of Germany's most skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. If the dams could be destroyed, it would absolutely annihilate their war production in a single stroke, oh, yeah. or at Cut least seriously damage it. But of course, these structures were huge and well protected, not to mention they were of course dams, which when you boil it down are in essence walls, long and thin, meaning that an airstrike would normally be impossible. But Wallace had designed a bomb that bounced along the water. Boing, if dropped boing, in the correct place, it would hit the dam boing. wall, sink, and then harness the water boing. pressure to amplify the explosion, blasting the boing. dam open. <laughs> 617 oh, Squadron boss. attempted to do exactly this, and mm -hmm. sure it. enough, they succeeded, destroying the Myrna Before and Ada Dam. After. Unfortunately, critical success wasn't achieved Before. as the Sorpe Dam was an earth bank designed dam rather than a traditional masonry dam, and thus the bomb didn't work against it. Had they managed to breach Sorpe as well by some miracle, it could very well have set back the German war machine by over a year. True. But alas, the damage was still extensive. Can't win them all. And the propaganda value was mm -hmm. immense. It was this mission that gave these men their name, the Dam Busters, mm -hmm. a name they still retain as they now transition to the F-35. <laughs> Soon, their fame and their special mission reputation took off. Pun definitely intended. <laughs> and so they were the ones tasked with doing things the RAF felt no one else could do. Like sinking an island during the Scheldt campaign, for example. Yep. And now it was finally time to sink Tirpitz for good. In fact, it was rather appropriate that they of all people were to be given this honour, as when Guy Gibson was finally informed about the Dam Busters raid, he said to Wallace and his superior that he thought the target was going to be Tirpitz. <laughs> Sadly, Wing Commander Guy Gibson VC was killed on operations, flying a Pathfinder Mosquito guiding a raid in on Dusseldorf on September 19th, 1944. He was 26 years old, Damn shame. and so he wouldn't lead this mission. But he had trained his men well. 617 Squadron had achieved greatness with their audacity, and it was now time for them to earn their other major victory. And once again, appropriately, it was Barnes Wallace who gave them the tool to do it. You see, the original design for the dam busting bomb wasn't a bouncing bomb harnessing water pressure. It was a very, um, uh, American solution. Namely, building a gigantic fuck off bomb requiring a completely new plane to be built around it. Basically, these guys built a fucking... Basically, here's how I think the fucking conversation went when it came to designing this bomb. Especially when it came to turpits. It went probably a little bit like this. Like, okay, guys, we have thrown everything in our arsenal at this fucking battleship. Nothing we have... Everything we throw at it just damages it. Severely damages it, but can't sink the fucking thing. And if we know anything from its sister, it takes a fucking hell of a lot to sink it. Well, shit we don't have. What? I need you to build a giant fucking bomb built solely to sink this thing. What do you got? Well, we have all this TNT and a lot of fucking cement. How heavy? Oh, it's gonna be fucking heavy. I don't care what you have to do. I want you to literally put in the math and build the bomb that will sink the turpits. Can you do it? I can't know. But the Americans, I know for a fact, can. Get the, get the fucking, fucking yanks on the line. And get me some fucking Tylenol for my head. <laughs> That's probably how that meeting went. 
the Vickers Victory Bomber in this case. Oh boy. But as fate would have it, the Avro Lancaster, due to its large bomb bay and simple undercarriage construction, mm -hmm. could be modified to carry almost any weapon system in the world yep. that could be carried by very conventional aircraft bomber. at the time. In fact, it's not very well known, but the B-29 in Ola Gay and Boxcar, notably the famous ones who dropped the atomic bombs, mm -hmm. those were actually modified. They needed to be modified to carry the nuclear weapons because they originally had a split bomb bay. Yep. They needed one big one. But this meant rearranging the wing spar and making tons of modifications to the airframe, which meant just in case modified B-29s weren't ready in time for Little Boy and Fat Man to be dropped, a squadron of Lancasters was deployed to the Pacific so they could drop them. Mm -hmm. It also meant they could carry whatever massive bombs that Barnes Wallace could develop. And so the infamous Tall Boy and Grand Slam were made. German infrastructure removal at a bargain price. Absolutely. Three operations yeah. would be carried out yeah, by these six These bombs were just, they are literally like, we have an indestructible battleship in Norway and all the fucking U-boat pens that just won't die. Build a bomb that will kill, with the sole idea of killing these two objects. We don't want them to kill factories. We don't want them to kill tanks. We want them to kill U-boat pens and turpits. That's it. Seven Squadron against Turpets. The first two, Operation Paravan and Operation Obviate, caused significant damage to her, weakening the already crippled ship still further. One tall boy scored a direct hit on the bow, penetrating right through all of her armor and the keel, eventually burying itself in the seabed below and detonating, blasting the front of the ship open, causing a substantial amount of water to flood the bow. Oh, yeah. Over 800 tons of it. Mm -hmm. She was barely seaworthy and forced to move to the island of Hakoya for repairs and fortification. It was because of this damage and the fuel shortages that she was decided to become a flak emplacement for the Luftwaffe to organize around, in order to draw RAF assets away from the raids on Germany. It would be the last voyage Tirpitz would make. Upon reaching her anchorage, 617 Squadron attacked again, with multiple near misses causing severe shock damage while wrecking her rudder and propeller shafts. In response, the Kriegsmarine constructed large sandbanks under the keel to prevent her from capsizing and reduced her crew to a garrison crew of 1,600 men. And she also only maintained a bare minimum fuel supply for running the ship's systems. Essentially, she would never sail again. But 617 Squadron and the Admiralty were not satisfied with that. She needed to be. They were tasked with sinking turpits completely. And that was exactly what they were going to do. In November, a final mission was planned. Operation Cataclysm. The end for Germany's largest capital ship. <laughs> what an appropriate name. Involving both 617 Squadron and 9 Squadron, a force of 32 Lancasters assisted by Mosquitoes, all of them carrying tall boys. Their flight plan had them coming in at 14,000 feet over the target. Which was a little high for accurate bombing, but the British had a secret weapon. 617 Squadron's Lancasters were fitted with the Norden bombsite. Oh, the most accurate in the world at the time. Damn right! And the only non-American bombers to use them. And they were operated by the RAF's most well-trained crews. On November 12th, 1944 at 0300, proceeding to their rally points individually, passing through a gap in the German radar net, detected by Pathfinders on previous raids, their rally point was the large Tornatrask Lake in northern Norway. A large feature that was easy to spot in low light conditions, and on H2S ground radar. Once the attack force had arrived on station, they formed into little gaggles of 5-7 to seven aircraft, and upon seeing the signal flare fired from Wing Commander JB Tate, 617 Squadron's leader, the two squadrons turned towards their target. Akoya Island near Tromso. Tirpitz's lair, from which she had been tormenting the Allies without so much as a single successful sortie. The lookouts and radar stations finally detected the incoming Lancasters, but given their varying formations and their different directions of approach, conflicting reports came in that were determined to be inconclusive. RAF squadrons were known to stage in the Soviet Union on occasion to hit targets in Eastern Europe, and so they were written off as transit flights. It wasn't until 8.50am 
that they realised a concerted raid was being launched, and given their heading, it could only be one target. Yet again, the terrifyingly effective young men of the Luftwaffe had been let down by the institutional failures of Nazi Germany. <sighs> Bad intelligence, shortcomings in doctrine, and no logistical support worth speaking of. Oh, but the look, worst factor the of all was, of course, the Nazi obsession so with pitting different departments against each other in order to foster Darwinian competition. It was so bad that there was no direct link between Tirpitz and her local fighter bases. It had to go through multiple channels and different layers of bureaucracy before aircraft could be scrambled. Jagdschwader 5 would ultimately become the scapegoat for what was about to happen, but of course in reality it wasn't their fault. In fact, it's a miracle they arrived as fast as they did. But as we know, it was far too late. Tirpitz's air raid alarm sounded and her gunners rushed to action stations. The best of the RAF began circling like sharks. I can picture it in my mind. What was going through their heads? Just like her big sister before her, the British methodically, meticulously and maliciously closed the noose around her neck. There was absolutely no escape. At 9.38am all of Tirpitz's guns began spinning fire at the Lancasters who were now closing in. Looking through their rangefinders, they could see the bomb doors opening and sure enough, the sinister long black shape of a single huge weapon could be seen hanging in their a cavities. Bomb built just for that. Unable to maneuver and without her fighter escort, all she could do was watch. 617 Squadron formed up in mass attack formation, in perfect unison, as though they were practicing for an air show, and at 941 they released their bombs. By 9.49, the span of eight minutes, all of their bombs were away. Each tall boy is 12,000 pounds in weight, 5,200 pounds of which is the explosive Torpex, which is 50% more powerful than TNT. So to put it in simpler numbers, each bomb is equivalent to roughly eight metric tons of TNT. So what makes up the rest of the weight? the armor penetrating tip and the fragmentation casing. That's right, this is a bunker busting fragmentation earthquake bomb with eight tons of TNT's worth of explosive. Tirpitz was torn apart. Two bombs tore into the port side of the ship, one near the forward turret, the other amidships, catastrophically damaging the boiler room while causing extensive flooding. The boilers then suffered a secondary explosion, setting fires throughout the ship. Another tall boy then penetrated the aft port side compartments next to Caesar turret and her magazine, starting fires and weakening the hull. The other 26 tall boys dropped, landed all around Tirpitz, rupturing her hull in multiple places below the waterline, while the shock damage and fragmentation tore apart her superstructure, now furiously ablaze. And after so many hits, the gravel and earthwork packed in beneath her hull to keep her upright gave way completely. Tirpitz began to list 20 degrees to port. Flooding was out of control, and the sheer force of the attack had killed hundreds of her crew already, while flooding had cut off hundreds more below decks. Damage control frantically tried to counter flood and then to pump the compartments out. It was then news came from the aft damage control teams. The fire near sea turret was burning out of control and it would soon reach the magazine. And at 9.50, while the last tall boys were still falling, it exploded. Tirpitz's rear compartments were consumed in flame and torn wide open, flooding the area completely, worsening Tirpitz's already horrible list. Captain Robert Weber, realising the horror that was unfolding, ordered abandoned ship. But most of her crew was trapped. It was eerily similar to the fate of her big sister before her. The wrath of the British Empire forced no other course. Tirpitz burned and burned. Flooding critically and then finally capsized. Drowning the men inside. Of 1,600 men aboard Tirpitz that day, 1,204 would not leave her. 
The RAF, meanwhile, filmed the whole event, which is showing on screen right now. The men of 617 Squadron, as well as their partners in 9 Squadron, return to base as heroes, with decorations being handed out en masse. Tirpitz, to this day, proudly appears as a battle honour on the regimental standards of both units. In fact, there was a friendly rivalry over who scored the killing blow between the two squadrons, of course. and so when a ceremonial piece of armour plate from Tirpitz was presented to 617 Squadron, there was a 50-year game of cat and mouse with each side stealing the trophy and then stealing it. <laughs> the Germans, meanwhile, met nothing but tragedy. They frantically assembled every man able to work and every cutting torch in Northern Europe in a desperate attempt to free men now trapped in the holes of the ship. But Tirpitz has a double hull, and the work was long and hard. And it's an armoured double hull. And the ice-cold winter waters of a Norwegian fjord killed most of the men trapped by hypothermia, even as their rescuers pulled them from the wreck. After four years of brutal struggle, desperate acts of daring, and the bravery of young men on both sides, Tirpitz had finally met her end. I find it odd. I do. That even I, someone who, as should be obvious, hates Nazism. Same here. With every fibre of his being. I feel nothing but sadness when telling this story. Two mighty sisters. Guarding a proud and upstanding people. A culture of philosophy and music fine art and architecture admired the world over. The beautiful German culture led into the depths of barbarism, brutality, and pure evil by men not worthy of the title man. More like monster. The markings on the bows of these ships were once a symbol of long life and peace, forever twisted by the evilest force to ever plague mankind. The truth, as I said before, is a tragic one. Tirpitz and Bismarck needed to be destroyed, and with that came the cost of the brave young men aboard them, young men enslaved to a monster. But at least we can live in the knowledge that all the men and women who gave their lives to stop them, and the men's lives that were taken in the name of the Allied cause, were all for the hope that a better world would emerge from it. And so by the grace of whatever gods there are, it came to pass. After this tremendous event, this titanic battle, very soon the people of Norway were freed, as were the rest of the people of Europe. Yep. But to this day, just the very name Tirpitz makes one reflect in awe. The idea that such a terror of the seas existed, and as her hull was scrapped over the coming years, her surviving artifacts were preserved in museums across the world. Even today, Norwegian road services still use plating from her to seal roads during repairs and bad weather, as though she is still guarding the fjords 70 years later. I've said it before and I'll say it again. She had a short life, but a storied one. And though she needed to be destroyed, it is imperative she must never be forgotten.
I'll wait then. <laughs> What's next? And that ends it. Okay, looks like I got more to go for. Okay, so as I was saying, and also thank you, Cosmic Brandon. I hope you do more anime or history. Oh yeah, I'm still doing Enterprise. I just had to do this one because my head admin called me out. <laughs> but to basically sum up, yeah, I, I'm with Anna Marquis' his, history on that one. Like, Germany was brainwashed, fooled, tricked, and enslaved by an evil ideology that unfortunately is still with us today. And I hate Nazism with a passion. I hate it with an utter passion. It destroyed so much. It has decimated so much. And it is unfortunate because these two, because the two ships, Bismarck and Tirpitz, were such magnificent vessels. And the fact that Nazism has bastardized and ruined so much, to the point where it, to the to the point where it's still affecting us to this very day, in more ways than one, and it makes me hate it even more with a passion. I despise it. I hate it. It's just horrible that, and, and it hurts every now, every every time because people will look, because I occasionally I still get comments, not just here on YouTube, but in real life when I tell people my favorite ship of World War II history was, was Tirpitz, and my favorite tank of World War II is the Tiger Porsche, and the S, and my favorite guns the STG, and so on and so forth. They're like, oh, you like a lot of Nazis? I'm like, no, I hate the Nazis. I hate them. I hate them with such a passion because they've done such evil and they have ruined so much. As he pointed out, the fucking swastika, which was once a symbol of long life and good luck, good fortune. It's now been twisted and molded into a symbol of hate and evil. And, it, and nowadays people can't go anywhere and look at it. I have, I have seen, I, I have seen people who have seen the symbol used in Buddhist temples. And they've said, what, did Buddhism support Nazis? I'm like, no, it did not. <sighs> it is an utter tragedy. Nazism is a horrid evil that needs to be stamped out. But history, and the only way, honestly, we can do that is by learning history. Not just the funny, I know I joke, I go around, I, go, I goof off, I have fun with this stuff. That's why I do these types of videos, is because they're goofy. I have fun. I do this to have fun. But in the end, we can't not forget that regardless of the implications of the war, men died on both sides. And any loss of life is a tragedy, especially... If, that, if the people that died were tricked into it. The sailors on Bismarck and Tirpitz were conned into believing in an, in, a, in an evil ideology that they thought, that they were tricked into believing that would help them and help their country. They were tricked, they were fooled, and they sold their lives because of it. Which, is even, which even adds more tragedy to it. Tirpitz will always be my favorite battleship, ever, regardless of whatever anybody else is. I mean, like, oh, the Iowas lasted longer, the Yamatas were more powerful. They're, and, and trust me, the fat electrician has definitely ripped into the battleships because, oh, they're just being shitty submarines. But it's not because that they were powerful or they, they were strong. They were just beautiful ships. Marvels of engineering, absolute powerhouses. It's war is hell. War is awful. And war changes. Don't I'm not don't going into Fallout. Miki, I'm an amateur I may be an amateur historian, but I am a historian. Of course I know the ghost division. Uh, like all the stuff I've seen in the comments, I love you guys, but seriously, like there's majority of things you're talking about, 
I know about in vivid detail. I do do this mainly because, number one, like, a lot of these guys, basic. I know, I've actually received a few comments saying that I'm a lazy YouTuber because I, because reaction videos are inherently lazy. To be fair, they're kind of right. To be fair, they're kind of right. But I still do them for one solid reason. They're fun. Yes, they're easy, and yes, they're lazy, but I want to add a little bit more effort. That's why I put a lot more effort into these videos, is because I want to have fun. It's all about having fun, adding to it. And when it comes to these history videos, yes, I know a lot of this history already, but there are some things I don't know, and there's stuff I can add to it, and stuff I'd like to discuss with these videos, or add to them. So it's all about have in the end my videos are all about having fun but i hope in the end that i teach people a little bit more about history or encourage them to look into it and form their own opinions and learn themselves that's what my videos are representing that's what i do that's why i do these history videos that's why i do what i do because i love this job even if it is even if it does make my fucking ba ba bankers go why are you still doing this why don't you get a real job <laughs> yeah it's not fun looking at my bank account sometimes <laughs> but yeah it is it is a it is definitely something to do it's it, it's something i love doing and it's stuff i want to help like it's my little contribution to this world and i love doing it okay enough of the enough of the sad shit it's time i've talked long enough we're approaching the two and a half hour mark jesus christ <sighs> so anyway I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. I hope you had a lot of fun. Do not worry, more Anamarchy histories are coming up. I'm definitely finishing Enterprise. Definitely looking at Bismarck, and I see definitely a few more here. I see Prince Oiken. I see Akagi. I see... What the fuck is that? I, I, I'm, um, I'll get to that at a later date, I am assuming. But yeah, there's a whole lot more coming, and don't worry. I'm definitely doing my other stuff. I'm just... Like, I'm planning to do Pyromancers and get back into Pyromancers again, but it's just finding a new way to set up this to record my new my new setup, which is over here, is just becoming a pain in the ass. So, they'll eventually come. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this video. And as always, you know who I am. I know who you are. I will see you all in the next video.